councillors, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Provost. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to City Council. Looks like there's something coming out of the top of my head there, by the way. Anyway, Roger. Thank you, Lord Provost. Welcome to this meeting of Dundee City Council, which is being held remotely in terms of Section 43 of the Local Governance in Scotland Act 2003. All members in attendance are able to fully participate in the meeting, which is being recorded. Should any member need to leave the meeting for any reason, can they please use the chat to advise of this? If a member loses their connection, they should make every effort to rejoin the meeting, but if this is not possible, the committee services officer will note their absence for the remainder of the meeting. If you have to leave the meeting due to a declaration of interest, you must remain out of the meeting until invited back in. Would all members please mute their microphones when not speaking to avoid background noise and turn off any smart speakers. Please start the meeting with your camera on. Your face will appear on the screen when you're speaking. If your connection is poor, you may wish to turn off your camera to see if this improves matters. If this... Start, pass start. Uh, if... I... if this doesn't help, please if this doesn't help, you may wish to quickly leave the meeting and rejoin. If you wish to raise a point of order, ask a question, speak on any item or move a motion or amendment, please use the chat when the relevant item is called. The convener will then invite you to speak. Would members of the press and public please not post messages in the chat? Where items are for noting or where there has been no disagreement expressed, the convener will call for any member who has a contrary view to indicate this through the chat, otherwise the item will be agreed. Please would members not use the chat for any other purposes, as those joining the meeting by telephone cannot see the chat and therefore will not be able to follow the debate. Although we are operating in a different way, this is still a formal meeting of the committee and the required standards of behaviour and discussion are the same as in a face-to-face -face meeting. Standing orders will apply to the proceedings and the terms of the councillor's code of conduct will also apply in the normal way. Does any member have any queries regarding this procedure? There are no queries, Lord Provost, so I will now ask the committee services officer to take a roll call for the minute. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I will now take a roll call for the minute and I would ask if members would confirm they are present when I call their name. Lord Provost. Present. Councillor Alexander. I'm here. Councillor Anderson. I'm present. Thank you. Deputy Lord Provost Cardell. Present. Bailey Dawson. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Nakla. I'm here. Councillor Flynn. Good evening, present. Councillor Hunter. Good evening, I'm here. Councillor Lynn. Present. Bailey Roberts. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Rome. I'm here. Thank you. Bailey Soares. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Short. Hello, I'm here too. Thank you very much. Councillor Smith. I'm here. Councillor Toland. I, uh, yeah, I'm here. Bailey Keenan. Present. Councillor Trickshank. Apologies. Thank you. I'll note those apologies. Councillor Finnegan. Hi, good evening. I'm here. Councillor McHugh. Present. Councillor McCurvin. Present. Councillor Malone. Yeah, I'm here. Councillor Scullin. Present. Councillor Shears. Uh, apologies. You think you'll note those apologies? Bailey Wright. Present. Bailey McPherson. A good evening. Present. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Good evening. Thank you, Councillor Creighton. Here. Councillor Duncan. Here. Bailey Scott. Here. Thank you, and that concludes the roll call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willie. Roger. Lord Provost, members of the Council, there are two items of business this evening. First of all, item B, the minutes which are information and record purposes. Any questions? 
Is this agreed? Thank you. Roger. Item C, general business, vacancies outside bodies. It is first of all reported that Councillor Shears has resigned with immediate effect from Dundee Contemporary Arts. The Council's instructions are requested regarding the filling of this vacancy. I see that Councillor McCurvin wishes to speak, Lord Provost. Thank you, Roger. Councillor McCurvin, please go ahead. Thanks, Lord Provost. I would like to nominate Councillor Scullin for the position on Dundee Contemporary Arts. OK, thank you very much, there, George. Councillor Scullin has been nominated for the DCA. Is this approved? Thank you. We'll take that as approved. Next, please, Roger. It is reported that Councillor El Nakla has resigned with immediate effect from the following outside bodies, Dundee Pride, Dundee Fair Trade Forum, and Leisure and Culture Dundee. Again, the Council's instructions are requested regarding the filling of these vacancies. Bailey Dawson wishes to speak, Lord Provost. Thank you, Roger. Bailey Dawson, please go ahead. Many thanks, Lord Provost. Just to intimate that the uh, the positions for the admin group, we will come back to council officers at a, a later date with the nominations for those positions. OK, thank you, Bailey Dawson. Thanks, Will. Is this approved? Thank you very much. We'll take that as approved. Uh, no more business, Roger, correct? That's us. That is correct, Lord Provost. That concludes the business. OK, thank you very much. As Roger says, that concludes this evening's council business. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Provost. The next committee is the Community Safety and Public Protection Committee. Good evening. Uh, we have two items on the agenda tonight. And the first one is the Dundee Local Policing Area Local Policing Plan. This is actually a really good report. Um, you will have all had sight of the consultation, and this is just following up from that consultation. Um, and we should have Chief Superintendent Phil Davis. Yeah, I could see him on Davis on uh, the call tonight. So if you've got anything that you need to say, please say it now. So. Um, It's one of the reports that you you have had consultation on. So, if ND has anything to say, could you say it? Before, or we'll just let Phil go. I'm not Chair, seeing anybody. Chair, there's comments in the chat. Uh, questions in the chat. Right, wait a minute. See if I can get the chat to work. George. No, yeah. wait a minute. no, it's um Yeah. Right. Like, do you have a question on this one, George? Yeah. No. Yeah. I do I do for the divisional commander. Um mm -hmm. which is I am I'm glad Chief Super's here. Um on the draft report, um my concerns are how how deliverable is this plan over the next three years, considering we've seen cuts to both the revenue and the capital funding uh, for 23-24 and year two and year three the policing plan uh, I would I would suspect there'll be further budget cuts in policing across uh, across Scotland um, we've heard ourselves in recent months the chief constable his own words were hard choices lie ahead to deliver effective policing um, he also makes mention of the revenue budget and capital funding being significantly lower than that needed to progress. Um, and only last month, the trade unions, Unite the Union and Unison, had made mention of the 74 million budget black hole. Uh, and their comments were around major cuts would have to be made in reducing police officers and staff carrying out key roles um, moving forward. So I'm keen to hear for the divisional commander, how that will ultimately affect Dundee and keen to hear what is the impact locally. Thanks, 
councillor, I think it's a really pertinent question and, and undoubtedly all public services are, are facing difficult choices and challenges at, at the moment. Um, and I think our chief constable has been uh, really transparent in coming out in respect of the challenges facing policing, as, as, as you've outlined. Um, I guess in terms of the local police plan that's presented here tonight, uh, the reality around about the hard choices for services is that we need to prioritise uh, first and foremost. And I think the consultation, the feedback from the public, the feedback from elected members in helping to uh, shape the, the local police plan as, as we see it presented here today is that that represents the key areas of priority that policing will be aiming to deliver against over the next three years. So yes, there are hard choices, but uh, in, in terms of, of capacity, um, but those are challenges that we've, we've faced and come through in the past few years through COVID with reduced capacity and then in the most recent year um, with the changes to police pension implications, which has seen uh, an element of, of resource uh, movement. So I, I think that whilst we have the hard choices ahead, the, the, I can give assurances to members that as, as far as possible, the, the, any aspects of service redesign that we're clearly going to be moving in to look towards will be focused on the, the areas that will have have and be able to minimise the, the impact as far as possible um, on our communities and will um, focus in the areas of, of key priority. And, and those areas of priority, as I've, I've mentioned, are those that are outlined in that plan. So I would certainly be hoping over the course of, of the three years to be reporting in with the um, with clear uh, assertions around about how we're progressing against those priorities and I could probably come back to the the next committee just in terms of the considered review uh, around about the hard choices we're having to to make and take um, in respect of, um, of of what that uh, and where that actually looks like in specific places for for Tayside. Chair I've got a, a supplementary of a can. Yeah okay George. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Chief Super. I, I'm just I appreciate what you're saying. However, for me, it's it's down to resources. If you've not got enough resources to protect and serve the Dundee people, um, that is a concern. And as elected members, we'll hear that firsthand from across citizens across the city. Um, do, do you feel that you have enough? operational officers and staff um, to carry out effective policing, not just this year, but for year two and year three as well. Kevin, I, I think the, the reality is that, um, you know, would, would I would I like and take uh, more resource if it was available? Of, of course I would. And, and I, I think all uh, elected members here would feel the, the same way because the, 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 the more resource you clearly have, the more you can then do uh, with that. Um, but uh, as, I've, as I've probably indicated throughout COVID, throughout this past year in particular, we've had some capacity challenges for a whole host of of reasons, and we've responded to them um, in a in a really measured way in in ensuring a, a focus on on those key priority areas. Y yes, that the the hard choices in our redesign um, will, will take place, but what what I can give assurances on is that that will primarily focus into areas of of the service that um, will enable any capacity that we need to create to be pushed back into frontline and community policing. Uh, the one thing the chief has said is that whilst there is is hard choices ahead, the prioritisation for policing will uh, be on frontline policing services, on public protection, and in our call centre areas. So, the the reality is that um, I have the resource envelope that I have, um, and I will make that work for Dundee, along with the support of Ross Fitzgerald as the, the local area commander. And, and we will we will maximise the usage of the local resources that we have available to us, but not just that, uh, flexing uh, the broader resources that are available to Police Scotland as a service. And I think Dundee has seen the benefit of that previously when we've needed to draw in the, the national specialisms that operate within Tayside and are able to support into Tayside. And whether that be through our roads policing, whether that be through our serious um, organised crime uh, division, specialist crime division uh, assets, 
uh, operational support division assets or, or otherwise, um, the, the assurance for members is that um, we, we will continue to flex policing to, to deliver the best services we possibly can for our communities. Thanks for that. I think I'll have a chat offline uh, with regards to your resource envelope. Um, thanks. And Dorothy's got a question as well. Actually, it was me, uh, next convener. Sorry, I've missed you completely. I'm trying to get my, no problem. my no worries. I've, I've had to put my phone on now. Uh, That's okay. Craig, you're next then. That's, that's okay, Convener. Uh, just, just before I ask my question, I'm not sure if the Chief Superintendent had intended to speak to his report or not, in which case I'm happy to wait until he's done so, or if it assists, I'll, I'll just go ahead and ask my question now. I'm happy either way. I think he's just doing questions now. Uh, I mean... Craig. Convener, I'm, I'm happy to introduce the, the, the report if, if members feel it's needed. I know it, it's previously been to the, the committee before in draft format, but I'm happy to give a brief introduction if, if that's of benefit. You're welcome to do it, Bill. Thank you and, and thanks to <coughs> members for a previous look and review of this. So essentially what's presented here today is the final version of the Dundee Local Police Plan for 23 to 26. Um, and it, it follows what has, has clearly been a lengthy public and stakeholder consultation stage, which members will recall from a, a previous um, inject at a committee. Uh, that, that has run from the 3rd of November through the 12th of February. Um, draft version has, has previously been to committee, uh, and, and I am grateful for some of the, the member comments that have helped to shape to this final version we've got today. Um, it, essentially, just a, a bit of reminder, the local police plan explains uh, how we will deliver policing priorities in Dundee over the next three years, um, with those activities in turn contributing to the broader Police Scotland organisational strategic objectives and in supporting the, the local Dundee community plan. Developing the plan for me has and, and will continue to offer the opportunity to work together with our partners and communities to understand the priorities that that matter the most uh, and, and to adjust and improve what we do to keep people safe. Um, the range of views, the data, the assessment and the public feedback that's come into this has been really substantial. Um, our local policing teams, for example, um, under Ross's guide, were, were out and about across Dundee engaging with, with communities over several months in the build up to this, um, gathering feedback through the Your Police survey and taking partner and stakeholder views. Um, and, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, it, it essentially, following that extensive engagement and consultation, then, then the ask of the committee today is, is to endorse the plan uh, for adoption in Dundee for the next three years. Uh, and following that adoption, uh, it will then form the basis of reporting um, against for the for the next three years from essentially the quarter one re reporting period onward uh, when that comes round and into committee in the future. Some of the slight changes that are presented in the plan is in terms of how we would propose to bring reporting into the committee, where there's a, a shift towards looking at thematic issues being reported in across the quarters uh, and, and that would, uh, I think, assist uh, a greater delve into conversation around about particular challenges and, and policing issues as the uh, as the year goes on. Um, but essentially, that, that that's it presented there today for for adoption uh, and approval by by members. Uh, thank you. Craig. Yeah, thanks, convener. And uh, just firstly, to the uh, my thanks to the chief superintendent for the you know, bringing what, what's a really good report to us, uh, and uh, thanks for introducing it. Um, the question that I had in mind for you, it's uh, it relates to page 18 of the actual report or page 25 of the committee papers, whichever you prefer, uh, but it goes, it's there's, at the very bottom of it, there's mention of increasing engagement with all of our local communities, which I'm sure we'd all be very much in favour of. Uh, I know in my ward that, you know, the the, the amount of people I get that, that would very much like to make contact with the police. Uh, and my question really is that there seems to be a yawning gulf between 999, which everybody knows is for the, uh, an actual emergency, and 101, 
which I get complaint after complaint about people simply abandoning their calls because they don't get answers or on occasions they get answers, but whatever was promised never happens. And I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts about how, how we can break through that. How can the police be more contactable on a non-emergency basis to residents who would very much like to speak to them? Thanks, Councillor. Um, a, a really good question. So uh, with the responses to the Your Police survey that's ultimately fed into this, it's clear that the public are looking for um, in, enhancements to how we uh, communicate and engage and, and how uh, they can you know, enable contact with, with the police. So clearly we've got the existing channels, some of which you've just described. There, there are new channels of of contactability and engagement that have come online through COVID and continue to be enhanced, such as um, online reporting and contactability. Um, and there is a, a national project that is uh, underway in relation to modernised modernized contact and engagement, which essentially will look to new technologies coming into play within our contact centres and broader, and that will help support the policing um, contact engagement strategy, essentially, uh, on, on the national basis. That should bring um, a greater suite of tools for the public to be able to access uh, in for information and to get quicker and more ready um, contact and support into, into the areas that they, that, that they need the most. On a, on a local basis, and it, it isn't just about our contact through our C3 um, and, and contact centres, but it, it's about uh, how we can best uh, engage uh, on that local basis with um, minority groups uh, in with uh, aspects of the community that maybe don't routinely have contact with the police to, to try and understand views, to uh, enhance different uh, sectors, uh, understanding around about public need and to continue to build up that appreciation of, of what the, the public public's ask of policing is and what the priorities are. So I think there's multifaceted approaches ultimately that fall into that uh, that part of the plan. And we will we will see those enhancements in our contact centre space, particularly through that national project over the over the period of this three year plan. OK, thanks. Thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, you know, there's going to be new contact channels coming on stream as it were. And I'm just really you know, some of which will be online. I suppose my plea really is that certainly a lot of residents in my ward, they, they like to do it somewhat the, the, the old fashioned way if possible. In other words, to pick up the phone because they don't all do online uh, or better still to actually meet officers face to face. Uh, and it's no criticism of police whatsoever. I think you're doing all you can with the, the resources available, but it's, it's just to make that point about there's a number of the people we don't like genuinely like to talk to the police, but they find it a bit difficult to, to make contact. Right, Dorothy, you've got a question. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I would echo Craig's comments about the report. It's very clearly laid out and in plain English, um, very readable. So if you have to read as many papers as the councillors do, um, this is a blessing that, you know, it's so, so easy to read. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question relating to page 15 of your report, National Strategic Outcome 2. Um, and down near the bottom, um, it says you will conduct high visibility patrols and engage with partner agencies. Now, what will these high visibility patrols look like? within communities? Yeah, so again, very much focused around about areas of, um, of priorities as they, as they emerge. Um, I think we all know and understand, for example, the challenges in Kirkton last year. So th th there is an example of uh, an, an emergent issue that we then look to collaborate together with partners and others and put together a focused plan of activity in, in, in pushing our resources into the, the right way so that there is that clear visibility and, and to ultimately um, provide that, that confidence and assurance around our communities that um, the police are there in the areas and at the times focused uh, in the right way. Um, Ross Fitzgerald's on the call here today and, and, and he clearly has that daily 
um, management of the of the local resources and assets and does push that focus into the areas of most need and it's probably appropriate that uh, I give him a chance to respond into that particular question as well councillor. Uh, thank you, sir. So I, I think for me, it's, it's around that responsive kind of public reassurance approach that, that we aim to deliver. I think to to touch on the city centre kind of remodel as well. So a, a model where we've seen um, it predicated upon kind of increased food and cycle patrols and less use of vehicles because that's a particularly um, effective um, way to deploy officers into that city sp centre space and also kind of chimes with the, the council's regeneration plan for the area and also the, the kind of the, the climate approach around the low emission zones, etc. So we're trying to kind of um, phase in our approach to match the kind of local authorities' ambition for particular areas of the city, and maybe that approach in the, the city centre as one. And there is undoubtedly a, a balance to be had. We, we all know that uh, a number of crimes have migrated online and into private spaces. So you know, high visibility patrols in public and delivering that reassurance is important, but requires to be balanced by the effective investigation of crime, which can often go behind kind of closed doors as well. So it's responding to those high profile incidents, those incidents that we know are the most impactive on local people and do leave that sense of unease and lack of safety and then trying to oh, kind of flex our resource proactively into that space to, uh, to reissue. Thank you. Um, I, I take from that, I, what I'm taking from that is that, that these high visibility patrols will be responsive and targeted. Yeah, Councillor, exactly. that's, yeah, that's exactly correct, Councillor. Some yeah. will be responsive to incidents that occur and others targeted through an accurate kind of demand analysis of, you know, high crime areas, what time are those crimes occurring, where are they occurring, and then trying to flex a proactive resource into those spaces to try and prevent incidents in the first place. So a, a kind of mixture of both, both approaches. Thank you. Kevin, have you got a question? Uh, I mean, it's a bottle of question, uh, you know, and a comment as well. We we obviously seen the letter from the chief constable that uh, goes on about the reduction in resource. I think there used to be some seventeen thousand police, uh, and now there is uh, what, sixteen and a half thousand, or just over it, uh, which is quite a considerable reduction in resource. And and we have obviously a local plan, and no doubt the questions that got asked earlier there, we called upon quite a considerable bit of national resource when it comes to the issues in Curtin, and no doubt locally we have to contribute a, a considerable amount of national resource to such inquiries as is going on within the SNP at the moment, or indeed looking at the, the First Minister's family. And then we had the previous First Minister where we had uh, uh, similar, very lengthy inquiries there as well. So I suppose, uh, you know, in asking about the resource, I would also call on members of the SNP if they know anything to come forward to the police and discuss anything that might be helpful to them in bringing that to conclusion as quickly as possible, uh, because I think there's a duty to do that. I'm not sure that the, the thing's been kept that secret about a spider's web of deceit, but... Uh, you know, if anyone was to have any information, I would ask them to bring it forward to the police. But, you know, clearly interested in the resource and how we manage the resource well in Dundee, given that, you know, these these national things must take up a huge amount of police resource. Really, Keenan, this is a live case you're speaking about. It's a, it's a resource of the police that's getting used at the moment, and I'm concerned about the plan that's happening here. Yeah, so in terms of resources, similar to the response to Councillor McCurvin's question earlier, yes, there is that reduction in resource that's been mentioned by the, the chief. The, the the response I would give you know, is, is the same as before, which is that the chief has prioritised frontline policing, public protection, C3 as his primary areas, that there is uh, an impact in terms of a reduction of some post numbers across each of the local policing divisions, but there is a, a greater reduction in those areas that uh, are, are perhaps more um, central back office based is probably the best way to describe them. In terms of investigations and flexing to, to inquiries on, on a national scale, 
um, in respect of, of, of that that you're referencing there, then there has been limited impact in terms of uh, on Tayside policing. Uh, we often gain the benefit more the other way, where we've had a number of uh, significant inquiries and investigations in the divisional area where the support from our specialist crime division and, and other areas comes in to provide that assistance and flexibility into us on that local policing basis. Thanks for that. I appreciate you, you'll do what you can to pe keep the people of Dundee safe. Lynn, you've got a uh, comment. Just an opportunity to um, thank um, our um, partners effectively. Um, the communities don't belong to us, the 29 around this table, um, and they don't belong primarily to yourselves. But often I think the police in the council are the ones that are uh, the problem solvers right across the board. Um, and it is really kind of um, promising and the successful relationships that are across um, both those areas. I know you have organisations like the COG, um, where everybody sits at a very senior level, but also across the kind of relationship that we have with um, officers across our communities. And I think it's really important. And, and often we don't emphasise enough about the proactive work that happens involving um, our communities and, your, and yourselves, where nobody counts where there's not a 999 call because of good practice and good help from yourself. So really, it's just to say thank you um, for the seven years that I've been around, the partnerships that um, I've kind of built up and the relationships across the board and continue through this next three years to uh, make sure that we do as much as we can together to support and protect those communities as much as we can. And basically, we can't cover everything, but as much as possible, have um, an opportunity to to speak to the people of the city and understand and um, respond to their needs, which I think uh, so far, um, considering some of the outrageous things that we've been going through from cost of living to um, uh, COVID, etc. You know, we've gone some through some really tough times and uh, those partnerships are so very strong. So thank you for that. And that's just my comment. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, next, we've got Fraser. Uh, thanks, convener. A, a comment and a question, um, if you don't mind. Uh, the comments really around the, the, the very valid points I think Councillor Duncan made in relation to engagement and in particular the 101 service, because I think we all get um, comments from time to time uh, from uh, residents about uh, and not just the length of time sometimes 101 takes to answer, but to be honest, it's very much a national service and it's lost the sort of local aspect to it. And um, it's only for, you know, if, if I may, just for Phil and Ross perhaps taking away, my personal view is um, that um, some, uh, having the 101 service regionalised would go a long, long way. Um, to actually addressing that particular issue. Uh, I'd welcome any comments on that. My question's actually about the very positive engagement that um, we've seen in, in various communities, not just in Dundee, I think I've seen it in Persia uh, within the divisional area um, as well, which is this coffee with a cop concept, which I think is a really good way, go going back to the comments earlier about the people who don't necessarily want to do things online. Um, I think that's a very um, good way of engaging with uh, members of the public in a completely non-emergency type situation. And I was just really wondering, that's happened in some some LCPP areas in, in Dundee and it hasn't in, in others. And I was just really wondering if it's planned to ensure that these sort of uh, in, engagement events take place in each and every LCPP area across the city. Councillor McPherson, thanks for the <clears throat> thanks for the questions. Um, I mean, I suppose qu quickly in terms of the response in relation to our contact centres. So we, we already uh, operate in essential a, a regional model within a national setup. So Dundee hosts the area control room for the North Region, 
Um, so that's based out of West Bell Street in Dundee and, and provides the, the, the 101 and emergency service re response and contactability for uh, the, the whole of the North region. And, and the, equally, the other two call centres are therefore based, one in the east at Bilston Glen and one in the west at Govan. Um, so that there's an element of regional model within the national. I think in relation to our call handling, then, then clearly that is part of the aspect of the, the part of the local police plan that has got um, engagement and, and contact uh, detailed within it. Um, so we, we can we can look when it comes to that reporting aspect uh, into committee to to likely uh, bring some further detailed information from the the, the C three space or or potentially uh, because we're going to move more into that thematic reporting to enable a bit more of a deeper dive on issues um, to bring uh, some supporting personnel and expertise from that area that that would be better placed to give th those direct answers. And in terms of your 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 query around about um, coffee with a cop, uh, the, the the reality is that that's the space we're really trying to move into in terms of understanding the needs and the best means of engaging with different communities. And and I think the reality is that different communities have different needs and different um, asks in, in terms of what's the best way to engage. So so for for some communities it is. Uh, along the lines of, of something like coffee with a cop, for, for others it's it's via other mechanisms. And I see Ross has got his hand up, like likely on that variable variability point. So I'm just to come in, just to come in on both points, if that's okay. I suppose just up, up on the first part, and maybe just give Councillor McPherson the reassurance that um, I'm engaged with my counterpart in C3, so effectively the, the chief inspector for C3 that that works out of headquarters, and we probably. Both of a view that um, the assessment of incoming calls would be improved if those taking those calls have got a broader understanding of the local context. It's not um, always possible to, to fully understand the implications of a call without understanding the context that sits within. I think the Thrive assessment that's delivered nationally is effective, but um, as, as a kind of a, a way of developing upon that, there's certainly conversations between me and my colleague in terms of how we inject that local context to allow uh, staff that sit in C3 in those control rooms to, to, to better allocate resources and work more closely with local policing colleagues to make sure that, that uh, the communication is better and our response is improved. So as a work in progress around that one, I'm more than happy to discuss that further with you um, off table, councillor. And I, I think in terms of the last one, um, I'm probably grateful for your comments around coffee and the coffee. I think it's a particularly effective model at times and does give that face-to-face -face contact, which people like. And again, I'm more than happy to sit down with you and look at a way to, to schedule specific dates for your um, LPCC area through the remainder of the year and going forward, if that would help. Uh, that's extremely helpful. I'm grateful to both Phil and Ross for these very helpful um, responses. I, I think the concept of coffee with a cop would, frankly, in my my opinion, would work in any community. I think the possibility of us dropping in, having a, you know, a cup of tea or coffee with your local officers and chatting about things and giving uh, residents that opportunity, I think is a really good thing. Um, I, I should maybe just say at this point, I'll take the opportunity to just say our community sergeant for the West End in Lochie has just changed recently from Sean Petrie to Stuart Payton. And I think it's um, uh, uh, Sean Petrie has been an exemplary community sergeant, I have to say, and I'm sure will do well in his new role. And I already have found the new community sergeant to be very responsive as well. So they are just typical of, you know, a service which others have also alluded to is well appreciated by ourselves in the Dundee public. And I'm always very grateful for the responsiveness of police officers. Thank you. And we've got Helen on for yes, a, a question as well. Yeah, thank you, Christina. <clears throat> um, I was just actually wondering what you meant when you were talking about cuts to the central back office. I just wonder if you could maybe explain that a bit better, what sort of posts are likely to be cut? Yeah, so if the priority is in clearly our frontline responding roles and the areas of greatest risk to communities, naturally where there is um, a reduction in um, resource or, or budget funding um, or, or budget funding is tighter than some of the areas, for example, in in change. So delivering change may be something that uh, we we would look at to, to take some of those hard choices in. Um, 
or in um, areas such as our, uh, you know, people in development areas, where where do we have aspects that we can perhaps look to do our business in a slightly different way? So it's not, uh, you know, necessarily completely cutting some of the functions. It's re repurposing and reprioritizing in those areas at the in the, the back office support areas to free up capacity so that we can ensure that it's best placed in our frontline areas. So that gives a, yeah. an example. So. I, I would, that worries me when, when we're not quite sure what I'm sure staff hearing this tonight will be wondering if it's their jobs that are likely to be cut. Um, you know, um, sometimes the uh, is it secretarial support or support officers or, you know, there's there's a lot of good work getting done uh, by the backroom staff and, um, you know, while we want frontline to work, uh, I feel it shouldn't be, you know, at the expense of another part of the service. So, so I, I suppose just for clarity, um, the Clearly, when we're talking about police officers here, uh, then essentially where uh, that reduction is coming from is is over the period of this past year. As we know that there's been that recruitment um, of filling up the, the 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 vacancies and such like um, has been a challenge on the back of pension changes. So it's actually a movements of posts primarily as opposed to people. And and where it's 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 people that we are reprioritizing. It's um it's that that not necessarily losing jobs. It's refocusing uh, where those posts are deployed. If that makes sense. Yeah, it sort of makes sense now. I just couldn't understand when you were saying cutting posts. Uh, really, so it's you're not really cutting posts if if you're only redesignating them to another area. Is that right? Yes, well, so, so if, if 17234, and you, members will, will note from in the, the media that essentially that's that's our, if you like, our tar was our target staffing number for police officers. Um, it, it essentially, through natural attri attrition, rec res resignations, retirals, and such like over the, the past year, and an enhanced uh, period of retirals through access to to new the police pension changes. Essentially, that created a vacancy lag over the period. So, what where where we enter into is that not refilling those posts gets us down to that sixteen six hundred. And what you then look to do in terms of that restructure and redesign is where best. Do we move people about to to ensure that the the posts are all in the right places? I hope I haven't overcomplicated things there with that. No, no, I think it's 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 fairly obvious. I think you are talking about cuts uh, to services uh, or dealing with them in a different way. But thank you very much for explaining that. Right, I'm not seeing any other questions for. Uh... Mr. Davidson, so um, would we be OK with agreeing this one? I'm not seeing MD say no, so can we move on to the next one? Thank you, Phil and Ross, for coming along tonight. Thank you. Do we now move to item number three, contaminated land strategy? Site Investigations Contract. You have this report for your approval. The Council has an, a strategy duty to have in place a contaminated land strategy to inspect the area, to identify contaminate, contaminated land and, if necessary, ensure that remediation is carried out. This report details the work undertaken in the year 2022 to 2023 on the delivery of our strategy and seeks approval to continue the site investigations and remedial work up to the value of 70,000 in this financial year. Is there any questions on this report? I'm not seeing any questions, 
So can we agree this report? I'm seeing nodding heads, so thank you very much. And I'm going to wait to shut the curtains properly because I've got a headache. So thank you for uh, for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, convener. The next committee is the Neighbourhood Services Committee. Hello, welcome to Neighbourhood Services. Um, we'll start the meeting with asking for any declarations of interest. I can see none. And then if you'll take us through, I, I think it's still Veronica. I'm just checking. You can take us through the agenda. Yes, it is. Thank you, convener. That's right. Item number two. UK Shared Prosperity Fund Multiply Adult Numeracy Intervention. Okay, you have thanks. this report for your approval. Thank you. So the um, Dundee has been allocated £968,616 in ring fence funding through the UK Shared Prosperity Fund to undertake adult, adult numeracy work under the Multiply programme over the next two years. Specific interventions listed at point 4.4 point four of the report can only be delivered at scale and Dundee and Angus College is the only known local further education provider who can deliver these types of inter interventions to the proposed number of people, around 800 adults. The Council in this report have been asked to approve the waiver of tender procedures through the issue of a VEAT notice in terms of Regulation 91 of the Public Contract Scotland Regulations 2015. The purpose of that is to alert the market to this intended award of a contract. This will allow any other potential provider to make themselves known within the time period. On the expiry of the VEAT notice, if no other uh, providers come forward, the report asks us to delegate authority to the Executive Director of Neighbourhood Services to develop a meaningful relationship with the College and de develop and deliver these courses to a target of 800 adults between April 2023 through to the end of March 2025. The sum involved in this work is up to 4,000 pounds or 400,000 pounds over the two years and the outcomes will be reported to corporate services and city development who will report back on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. The report also asks us to note that 392,000 of the funding will enable us to appoint three community learning and development workers who will be delivering numeracy training across the community over the next two years and it allocates £176,616 into a challenge fund which will be open to the third sector to allow, to allow them to bid um, for numeracy training work. Um, I'd just like to open this up and see if we have any questions on the report. can't see any questions in the chat. Um, are, Nadia, is that a question? Uh, yes, please. Just to, yeah. I, I think it's wonderful to to receive the funding, and it's such a you know important um, piece of education that everyone has a right to. I just wondered, in terms of Angus um, and Dundee College, um, and I know you've said working with third sector, will there be that relationship there to determine how to get to the most vulnerable, hard to reach groups? Um, would that be kind of relying on DVVA to provide that information? Do we know if there's any key organisations that we're working with? OK, so there's a number of set um, criteria that has to that have to be met in order to qualify for the funding. Um, Dundee College is going to focus on three of those criteria. So they're, they, if they get the contract, they'll be focusing on adding modules into relevant courses, vocational courses. They'll be focusing on working with um, employers to deliver numeracy training and they'll be targeting um, training at people who don't have level five maths. All of the other areas like the hard to reach um, groups, um, hard to reach learners, that's what we'll focus on through the work that we'll be doing through our three community development um, workers and through the third sector. So it's to make sure that the college managed to do the courses that comply with those specific criteria and then our staff pick up and make sure that we reach as many people as possible. I don't know if Marie would like to come in and say how we're hoping to reach some of those groups, Marie. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, we'll be working with a lot of the existing organisations. So we've already been speaking to organisations such as the 
carers groups um, lead, which is linking education and disability. Mm -hmm. So basically what we're looking to do is to embed numeracy in work that's already happening with key organisations. Oh, that's fantastic. It sounds like, you know, we're trying to make sure no one falls through that net and can be supported in lots of different uh, different uh, places across the yeah. city. So thank you for okay. that. OK, I can't see any other questions. Can I take it that report is approved? Right. Veronica, if we could go to the next item on the agenda. Item number three, tenders received by the Head of Housing and Construction. You have this report for your approval. Um, the tenders in the report relate to the supply of plumbing and heating materials um, and the supply of boiler materials over the next three years to 2026 through various um, various contractors. I just want to ask if there are any questions. And if there are no questions, are people happy to approve these tenders? Thank you. Veronica. Final item is tenders received by the Head of Design and Property. Again, you have this report for approval. Thank you. So here um, we have four tenders that we're hoping to award to construction services for one heating kitchen bathroom repairs to around 50 houses, a window replacement to approximately 40 homes, urgent roof repairs to various properties, the refurbishment of Camperdown Play Park area public toilets. I'm sure Daniel won't miss the moment to come in and welcome that. Um, but the plan is to make the toilets fully accessible. And the report also in, includes three tenders to be awarded for the development of mugger pitches at Douglas Community Park, Beechwood and Kirton. Right, I can see you there, Daniel. Oh, sorry, and let me just check. I'll bring in Mark first. Mark Flynn, Councillor yeah, Flynn. Fine. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Just to say, I welcome all these uh, reports and I actually welcome all the work that's been done, including the toilets at Camberdown. We're we'll getting there before Daniel, <laughs> just to say it. <laughs> but my question is basically based around the mugger pitches. And uh, I'd like some comments uh, on the actual tenders themselves from uh, Mr. Martin, if possible. There's a, quite a substantial difference in the mm -hmm. costings that have been put forward for the tenders. I know tendering processes do get a variety of costs, but they're quite substantial. Uh, the first one, for example, 54,000 difference, 62 and a half and 51 for the third one from the lowest to the highest. I just want to be reassured that uh, from the officers that the quality is really important here. And we make sure that um, just one reassurance that the quality is of the standard we're expecting to get. And the costings are just simply mm -hmm. an accounting error. Um, that's a question I asked of Mr Boyle. I could see uh, Mr Boyle's there. Would you like to comment at this point? Thanks, could we not? Uh, yeah, I can confirm that both quality and return costs were assessed by the Council on the basis of a 60% cost, 40% quality for each of the returns. The quality question set uh, reflecting each of the commissions. Quality is ranked in order of scores rather than providing an absolute indication of quality. The reason there are differentials in ranking across the projects is each of the three projects have differing technical requirements. How the suppliers have addressed these differences is yielding the varying scored returns. The difference in costing reflects how each of the tenders have viewed the market conditions and their own workload capacity. In the, the assessment, there's nothing to indicate anything abnormal in terms of low costings. Thanks, Kimbira. Just come back, Kimbira. Yes. I just, I just uh, thanks for that, Tony. It's really helpful. I just want to ask again: Did anybody ever visit any of the sites where this company actually have the the uh, mugger pictures, just to make that reassurance again that the the quality is of a good standard? Mr. Boyle, I think I can't answer that specifically, convener, but I can tell you that we have used these companies before, and I've got every confidence they should be able to do the job that they've tendered for. Can I just check if Mr Martin wants to come in in response to any of those questions? Neil? Um, I, would, I, would, I would just add, thanks, uh, convener, thanks, Councillor Flynn. I would just add, I think the variety in cost reflects also the volatility in the market and uh, the scarce resources that we're seeing. So some contractors uh, will maybe be a bit more selective in terms of how they put their tenders together and which particular projects they're targeting, while some others have maybe got a different approach depending on their current workload. 
Um, in terms of site visits, I would have anticipated that uh, the contractors would have visited or would already be familiar with the sites prior to putting their tenders together to ensure that they could meet the design and specification. And as Mr Boyle outlines, uh, in terms of delivering the, the quality pitch that we would expect. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. No, that's fine. Thank you. OK, um, Bailey Scott, I could see you have a question. Yes, thanks, Convener. I wanted to ask about the urgent roof replacement and the half million pounds um, for that. I wondered how it's determined because we don't know um, what roofs are to be replaced by the very nature. It's urgent roof replacement. How is the figure of half a million determined? Is it based on previous spend in the last financial year that was required for urgent roof replacements? And if half a million isn't needed uh, by the end of the financial year and it turns out that they didn't have to spend as much as that, mm -hmm. do we get the underspend returned as surplus? Yeah. Thank you, Billy Scott. Can I bring in Elaine Swirling, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, the budget is based on previous year's spends, um, so it's anticipated that's um, the kind of demand that we would have for that budget uh, in terms of urgent roofs. But any underspend in that budget would be carried forward in the capital programme. We would be able to reuse for other projects within the capital plan. Bailey Scott. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and Councillor Coleman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm very pleased that the Keswick Terrace um, multi-use gaming area um, developers are, are coming along. They're, they're very much to be welcome. But given the number of similar projects with a similar completion date, um, can officers definitely guarantee the completion date noted in the report? No, would that be Louise? I think that might be me, Convener. Oh, sorry, 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 Tony, please come in. That's Convener, thanks, Councillor Coleman. Yeah, we've got every confidence you should be able to hit the milestones that we've set out in the tender reports. Thanks. OK, I can't see any other questions. Are people happy to approve the report? So I think that is us for this evening. I will hand over um, to the leader for policy and resources. Thank you for your attention this evening. Thank you, Convener. The final committee this evening is the Policy and Resources Committee. Good evening, folks. We'll crack on with the business. So, Willie, hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Firstly, are there any de declarations of interest? Declarations? Nope. I see nobody typing, so I'll take that as a no. Okay, thank you very much. That then takes you on to item two, which is Capital Expenditure and Monitoring Report. This is for noting. Okay, so this is the regular update report. So can I just seek any questions or contributions? I think Councillor Crichton, you've popped up on my computer, Michael. Thank you, Convener. Um, with regards to the information on page 15, showing a tiny revised budget in 22-23 of 300,000 compared to the original budget of 4.3 million for external insulation, and even tinier spend of just 98,000 by 28th of February. Can officers give some assurances that the delay programmes will be fully caught up in 23-24? Thanks very much for the question, Michael. As you know, there's been extensive work over the last few years, uh, particularly on those areas of focus. And given the prominence of the issues that we're seeing across the city in terms of cost of living, we all know how much of a priority uh, that work is in terms of making sure that all of the accommodation that people find themselves in is up to standard. Um, now, I will bring in Elaine at this point. I think, uh, Elaine, can I bring you in just to offer an input to that question, please? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Yeah, we're working really, really hard to, to bring forward the um, remaining external wall insulation programmes. Um, there has been slight changes in terms of criteria and funding arrangements, so we've been working those through. Um, but we would hope to bring those tenders back to committee um, before the recess. Certainly, we're certainly working hard to deliver that. Thanks. Is that all right, Michael? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thanks very much for the question. I see no other questions on this item, so can I take this report as agreed? Thanks very much, Willie. Yeah, thank you. Item three, then, so revenue monitoring report. You're asked to give recommendations. 
Again, standard report with some variants within the figures that you may well have some questions on. So I'll bring in Bailink first and first. Fraser. A uh, question on page 21 in relation to uh, some of the information about overspends and underspends. And in particular, uh, the projected underspend on Scottish Welfare Fund and benefit cap redetermination. And I'm just really wondering why there's a £450,000 underspend on areas like the Scottish Welfare Fund expenditure at a time when we have a cost of living crisis and clearly a lot of people in real need. And I was just really wondering if we could have a, a bit of an explanation as to why that has occurred. Thanks. It's a really good question. We link first and I know the person that will have the answer. So, Jackie, I'll bring you in in just a second. But um, can I say with um, just very limited kind of introduction before I bring Jackie in that this has obviously been a core area of focus and there's been extensive work in consultation and engagement. And I know that Jackie and the wider team have also engaged uh, extensively with the Dundee Fighting for Fairness group and the Fairness Leadership Panel to help inform the approach that we've taken uh, in terms of maximising and getting as much money into the homes and pockets of those individuals that need the support. But with that said, Jackie, can you come in on the specifics, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Bailey, Bailey McPherson, for the question. Um, this was actually down to additional funding that we received um, later in the year. So we got additional funding for benefit cap cases, um, for full mitigation of the benefit cap uh, cases. And we also received additional funding for Scottish Welfare Fund. And that's why there's there's an underspend. Um, without that additional funding, we would have fully spent on both budgets. OK, can I just be clear then, Jackie, that um, this is not money that will in any way be lost and can be used in 23-24. Um, um, and, and it's simply a timing issue more than anything else. It's not that um, additional um, funds received by the council will not actually be spent on uh, those uh, families that require that support. No, okay. this money can be kept by the council and will be carried forward or requested to carry forward into 23-24. Thanks, Jackie. That's very reassuring. Thanks. And I think, again, just to reiterate that point, um, I think we're all, all 29 of us, uh, fairly resolute in our view that any money that comes into the council that can benefit communities should stay within the council. And the carry forward is obviously welcome. And it was uh, just about the time and issue. So that money, I'm sure, will be very well received and utilised by the team as well. So thanks for your question. Uh, I see no other questions on this particular item. So can I take the report as agreed? Thank you very much. Move on. Thank you. Thank you. Item four then is the Common Good Fund Revenue Budget Report. You're asked to give the proposals. Again, this is the annual report which sets out how we will utilise the Common Good Fund with the £120,000 which is available in the way that's detailed within the report. Uh, is there any questions, comments on this report? No. Can I take it as agreed, please? Thank you very much. Willie. Item five before we use a Brexit update report. This is for noting. Again, first of all, can I thank Andrea and the team who have done an extensive amount of work um, essentially since Brexit occurred and before Brexit officially occurred in keeping us up to date and appraised of all of the developments. And we all know there is an extensive amount of work um, and challenges that have arisen during that period of time. And, I, you know, I think we should absolutely give credit to officers uh, for pulling that all together into the most concise reports uh, they have been able to do so and keeping them up to date in the way that they have. There is a series of recommendations in this report and again looking at mainstreaming that report and uh, going forward so there isn't the standalone reports but I can see there's a couple of comments and a uh, motion so I'm going to go to questions first and then I'll come back to your motion Councillor Anderson. Uh, so I think uh, Councillor Duncan, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, convener. A couple of comments as well, actually. So just first, we'd say thanks to officers for, for what's a, a very comprehensive, uh, well-researched re report. Although I have to say it's quite a disturbing report, um, considering uh, Brexit, I've yet to personally identify any real positive consequence of, of, of um, having taken this course of action. Uh, I say that because if you if you look on, say, page 41, for example, there's a couple of reports by the very well-respected London School of Economics, 
One saying that you know the the range of uh, UK goods to the, the the EU being exported has shrunk. Uh, no, so. just about yeah. Do you want me to come and get you? Yeah, somebody uh, somebody <laughs> needs to mute themselves. <laughs> Okay, right. Yeah. Shall I just continue, convener? Please continue. Good, thank you. Okay, yeah, just again, then the 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 other one um that struck me certainly the, the last paragraph of page 41. Um leaving the EU again, it's the the, the LSE has 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 uh, done this uh, report. They reckon that um it's cost the average household, and bear in mind it within a cost of living crisis, but they think it's cost the average household in the UK something like 210 pounds. Uh, mainly related to food expenditure, which of course, if you're in a poor household, most of your expenditure does go on basic stuff like food, energy, etc. So it's just to say that you know it's 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 disappointing. You know, with, with I'd like to say that you know we we used to hear talk about getting Brexit done. Um, I never actually, to be honest, never knew what that meant, and I'm quite certain that the person who used to say that never met, never knew either. So my question would be um, at four four point one point four. There's really disturbing news uh, about um, a massive um, a loss of money to the Dundee and Angus College, uh, which again, the, the culprit here is Brexit. Um, I note that there's a limit to what the council can do because of various restrictions and stuff like that. But um, my question really would be, there's mention that a letter has been sent to the UK and Scottish governments about the distribution formulas used for such allocations. And I'm really just hoping when we get answers, hopefully from both of these governments, can we have sight of them, please? Thanks for the question, Craig. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure officers would be happy to share that. Uh, so officers and myself regularly engage with uh, Dundee and Angus College, uh, and I'm sure uh, they would be more than uh, happy to share the information that's available to them. Obviously, we've all seen some of the announcements most recently related to the college as well. So every penny is a prisoner right now and has an impact very directly on the services they can provide. But Andre, is there anything you'd like to add in response to that question? I mean, we obviously work closely with the college and you'll have heard about the multiplier report this evening, which obviously has slightly different funding that will go to the college. So I think the impact was around the UK Shared Prosperity Fund changing and funding not going via the Scottish Funding Council from European funding. So I think that's where the gap is, but obviously working with the college to see what mitigations could be put in place um, and obviously continuing that lobbying about the UK Shared Prosperity Fund as it increases in years to come. Thanks very much and thanks for the question. Um, I can see the rest are, are comments, so I'll go back to the motion since there's no further questions for officers at this point. And Councillor Anderson, I'll bring you in to move your motion and then uh, Councillor Dawson thereafter. Thank you, Councillor Alexander. I assume this will be shared on the screen, but um, I will read it out. While yeah, and if we waiting. can ask committee services to circulate via email as well, thanks. OK. Um, the, the motion basically has two, two points. Um, Dundee City Council notes with dismay, dismay the continuing ne negative impact of Brexit on our city. As a result of the UK government's decision to drag Scotland out of the EU in 2020, Dundonian households are paying more for food, businesses are exporting less, construction costs have store, soared and investment in education and science continues to plummet. Council therefore asks the Leader of the Council to write to the UK Prime Minister to express our continued concern at the entirely negative impacts of Brexit on Scotland's economy. In addition, given the Prime Minister's recent enthusiasm for the benefits of his Windsor framework, we ask Mr Sunak to widen the Windsor framework to include Scotland and thereby ensure that Scotland could be in the quote, unbelievably special position of having tariff-free access to both the UK and EU markets. So as the European spokesperson on the Council, I just couldn't sit quiet while we saw this report come to the Council. The fact is Dundonians are poorer because of Brexit. As this report shows, Dundonian households are paying more on food, businesses are exporting less, and investment education and science continues to plummet. Since the UK dragged Scotland out of the EU in 2020 against our will and without our consent, unless anyone's forgotten, food prices have soared, labour and supply chain shortages have increased and the cost of building materials have gone through the roof. 
Scottish businesses just this morning highlighted Brexit as a threat to their business. The British Chambers of Commerce says that more than half of the firms surveyed are still struggling to meet trading arrangements. The Centre of European Reform, as Councillor um, Craig Duncan reports, reports a 7% reduction in trade last summer. They state that the UK economic output is 5.5% smaller than it would have been had we remained in the EU. Britain, of course, has the distinction of being the first country in the world to impose economic sanctions on itself, and we're now performing even worse than Russia. Since leaving the EU in 2020, the report highlights that households have paid an average of £210 more for food up to the period ending 2021. And since then, things have only gotten worse. Increases in food prices are now at a staggering 19.1%. Olive oil has gone up 50%, milk 40%, cheese and eggs 30%, vegetables costing 20%. I was speaking, I was at the Hilton Community Centre today and they were talking about in the food larder about how they can't have cheese anymore unless they split up packs because of the price. The Tories are always saying this is a global phenomenon, but it just so happens we're in a much worse mess than the rest of Europe. The UK inflation rate is over 10%, and other European in the average Euro rate in the Eurozone is 6.9%. Italy, Germany, France and Spain are sitting at 8%, 7%, 6.7% 6 and 3% respectively. The UK is doing much worse. I also wanted to highlight the concerns in this report over funding for science and further education. When we were in the European Union, the UK secured 10% of the Horizon 2020 funding. It, the, U, the UK coordinated 34% of their search. 10% of those researchers were based in Scotland and we secured 12% of the overall programme. We were punching way above our weight. Over the last two years, we've been excluded from this 100 billion euro programme and Scottish universities and colleges have lost ground. Our very own Dundee and Ang Angus College is estimating a further £1 million cut. And rejoining Horizon 2020 is still on hold because we've got to wait on Rishi Sunak's Windsor framework, framework replacing Johnson's Northern Ireland Protocol, which brings me to the framework. When announcing the Windsor framework, as if to rub salt in the wound, Sunak declared that the framework would put Northern Ireland in, and I quote, an unbelievably special position with tariff-free access to both UK and EU markets. He declared with almost childlike enthusiasm, nobody else has that, no one, only you guys, only here, and that's the prize. Well, that's exactly what we all had before we were taken out of Europe. That's what everybody in Scotland benefited from. It really is time for the Liberal Democrats, who, like the SNP, have always been European at heart, and the Labour Party, to break their silence over Brexit and join the SNP in stating their commitment to rejoining the European Union. Both Northern Ireland and Scotland voted against Brexit. 62% of Scots voted to retain their rights to travel, trade, work, study, live and benefit from employment, environmental and civic rights of the European Union. If, the, if Northern Ireland can get special measures, so should we. We can't sit quiet while this goes on. We must speak up. So we're calling you to please support the motion. Thank you, convener. Thanks very much, Kimdall, uh, Councillor Anderson, with a minute to spare. So well done on that. I will pass over to Bailey Dawson uh, to second. Bailey Dawson. Thanks, convener. Thanks. Um, Heather and Craig, I suppose, have stolen some of my, my thunder from what I was going to say, but I think it's worthwhile just kind of repeating. And and as the previous uh, EU spokesperson, um, we've been in this chamber many, many times before discussing the same thing. And have things improved? Nope. Not a chance. UK is still continually shooting itself in the proverbial foot day after day with a gun loaded by the Brexiteers themselves. And they just love firing it. They just absolutely love firing it. Craig mentioned the, the benefits. Well, the, the Museum of Breakfast, Brex, Brexit benefits is still to put anything on display. Meanwhile, Tory government really thinks it's still the best thing since sliced tomatoes. And that's when you can actually buy tomatoes to slice in the first place. So, you know, Heather's mentioned the rising costs and she's mentioned some of the things we've lost, but it's true, we've, we've lost the automatic right to live, learn, work and to trade freely with perhaps 
the most important block of countries on our doorstep. Heather's mentioned that we've stepped back from programmes that support not only our scientific advancement, but easy sharing of good practice and the opportunities for our young people have all gone. Or if they've not all gone, they've been really, really depleted. We've added layer upon layer of bureaucracy, not only on imports and exports, but on the day to day lives of those who need to travel and do business in the EU. We now have a levelling up fund and a UK Share Prosperity Fund that goes nowhere near levelling us up or sharing the prosperity and does not match up to the benefits that membership of the, the EU once gave us, unless you're in a Tory seat, allegedly, when it's, you know, it's brilliant for you guys, but yeah, it doesn't give the same back to us. And the Turin scheme, which doesn't offer the same benefits for our young people as fully participating in the Erasmus scheme, lessening the chances and experience for, for our young people to have. I think what's damning is I think even some businesses are now starting to say that Brexit is affecting them more than COVID has done. And I think that's a quite damning statement, I think. And I think even the, the boss of Ryanair was quoted in the press as saying Brexit is holding us back. Interestingly, um, a poll in the London Economic yesterday shows, as they put it, buyer's remorse for Brexit, with 61% of those surveyed now being in favour of rejoining the EU. That's a 4% increase since the last time the survey was actually done. Senior MEP is also quoted within that report as saying that these figures are very indicative of the mood across the UK right now. Brexit has failed everyone in the country, and he couldn't he couldn't be further from the he could further from the truth. It's now time to rejoin was his parting shot, and I agree with him. It's time that the Tories and the Labour Party in Westminster just said to the people of the UK, "Sorry, folks, we made a big mistake. Let's look at this again. We can't continue like this." Dundee didn't want Brexit. Scotland didn't want Brexit. It's now clear that by only rejoining the EU, EU can we as an entire nation reverse the damage that has and is being done. Um, we were promised the world, we knew Brexit could not deliver the world. We were promised an oven ready deal. Well that's in the food recycling bin now and the ingredients have changed. The promises on the side of the bus, yeah they've come to nothing. So if Westminster still refuse to look at reversing Brexit, then I look forward to the day that Scotland takes its seat as an independent country at that table. The light is still on for Scotland and Brussels, and I believe it's still firmly shining. But, you know, that's not what's being asked for in this motion. It's my personal thoughts on that, but I urge you to support the, the motion as put across by Heather. Thanks very much to you both for so eloquently and articulately uh, setting out the issues and the disaster that is Brexit and why we need to continue uh, to push for a better deal for Scotland and for the city of Dundee. I will bring in other colleagues. So Councillor Rome next. Thank you, convener. And uh, as is typical when I try and um, put down a motion to speak, um, my daughter is kicking off. Um, that's me back to a bit of silence now. I'm not going to be anywhere near as eloquent, I, I assume, as Councillors Anderson or Dawson or need Councillor Duncan. Um, it's just a brief point of personal experience. I'm deeply saddened by the loss of opportunities for um, for all of us, but indeed for our children going forward, which is due to this absolutely catastrophic Brexit deal, if it can be called that. I had the opportunity and the privilege when I was in third year university of studying on an Erasmus scholarship in France. Uh, and indeed, uh, sorry, an Erasmus exchange, and I got a scholarship to go there as well. And I know many people that did, and it was a life changing experience for them. Uh, and it's just an awful shame that people wouldn't have those same opportunities. And it's been sacrificed on the altar of um, disagreements and, uh, and and pettiness. Uh, and really, there's no need for it. Uh, as we've heard from the, the previous people that have spoken, you know, the mood has changed. And the mood in Scotland uh, and in other places in the UK was never in favour of this, and yet we've been dragged into this. And we see just how terrible the situation we're now in in terms of the loss of opportunities to trade, the loss of opportunities for education. Uh, I don't have the exact figures, but there's been press recently about the catastrophic drop in school trips between France and the UK because of the visa costs and difficulties. And it's just a shame that we're seeing both the economic damage and the cultural damage uh, in the loss of opportunities for, as I say, people nowadays and our children going forward, unless we're to rejoin either in our current constitution or in independent Scotland. And I would love to see that opportunity come. Uh, and I'm deeply dismayed by what we now have, which is presented to us as a good deal, which is more complicated than ever before, with more rules than ever before, which was the exact opposite of what was sold to the people who voted for it. So I'm deeply dismayed uh, and I hope that everyone welcomes this um, Brexit update uh, and the amendment for it. Thanks very much for your comments and uh, you know those views on the challenges, particularly from an educational point of view, not just for the opportunities that might have uh, afforded many um, 
you know, many students in Dundee, but also uh, the challenges that our universities and academic partners now face in attracting uh, EU nationals. And I was visiting the University of Dundee today and last week, and that came up uh, on both occasions in terms of the impact on the attractability, I suppose, of the universities to European students in particular. Um, so thank you for that. I'll bring in Kipsler Tolan next. Thanks very much. Um, I, it seems to me that ever since Brexit, we've been trying to kind of expand our language on terrible, um, on what te a new new versions of terrible, catastrophic, were dismayed. I mean, Brexit has been utterly, utterly devastating, and and um, all the speakers before me have, I think, have very, very well they put um, the the problems that we're having. But for me, there's a couple of other issues that we've maybe not addressed, and that is the issue of democracy. Um, and the issue actually of human rights as well and citizens rights and this is what Brexit has um, allowed to happen is we've got a continuous degeneration now of our democracy and our human rights. If we look at and I've just lost my page yet, it's um, 2.3 for instance, 4.23 4, sorry, um, talk about the, the, the high court saying that like um, EU citizens that didn't have peace elsewhere. Um, could potentially become illegal. Now that's just that. I mean, that's just completely dismantling our rights as as human beings across the nation. If you look at the EU retained bill, which myself and and um, Pete Shears put forward as a motion only just a few weeks ago, the attack on workers' rights um, on a day to day level is is a direct result from Brexit because what Brexit has allowed us how has allowed the UK government to do is actually begin to chip away at all the rights that we have sought and that we had protected within the European Union and that is something that we should be absolutely horrified by in addition to the massive economic loss, the massive cultural loss, I think that Stephen was talking about very well as well. The losses have been huge, but it's losses on our human rights and it's also losses on our democratic right. The phrase that comes up again and again and again that we never seem to unpick is dragged out of Europe against our will. This was one of the most undemocratic acts up until the Supreme Court in judgment, I suppose, or up until the refusal of the, the independence referendum. Um, Scotland as a nation, not as a region, rejected Brexit absolutely. A two, was it two, two thirds re, was a rejection of, of Brexit. And here we are still suffering the consequences, the economic, the social, the cult cultural, the human rights and the democratic consequences of Brexit. The first thing that the UK government did after Brexit was try and bypass the UK Parliament. And that set the tone for the lack of democracy that we've now got. Um, I'm appalled by Brexit. I'm appalled by the fact that we're still stuck in this place and it's allowed the Westminster government to become increasingly more hard, increasingly more right wing and increasingly more harsh against the rights of our people um, within Scotland and within the UK generally. I think it's an appalling and sad, sad process that we're all stuck in this and it feels that we're completely powerless because there's no democracy in this process anymore either. Thanks very much, Councillor Toland, and I think there's a number of things that you said that certainly hit the uh, nail on the head. Uh, as we've seen over the last few months, you're right to reference the attack on uh, trade unions, the hard-fought rights and protections, but beyond that, we are seeing, of course, um, uh, you know, a divergence in standards with European counterparts. We're looking at food legislation, we're looking at um, even practical terms, when people go abroad now, the rate they pay using their mobile phone, there's a divergence in that. So there are costs being incurred by members of the public in so many different ways, and this report just illustrates some of those. But we know that, that it's also about rights and protections, and fundamentally, uh, that's not good for anyone. Um, so I will bring in Bailey Keenan next. Thanks, Convener. Convener, I, I would have been prepared to, to support the motion with a slight change, and, and that would be the, the bit that diminishes the democracy as far as I'm concerned, and that would be, I don't believe for a minute that we were dragged out, against, uh, out of Europe in Scotland. I think that people in Scotland also voted to leave Europe, 
and would, would take the collective decision that we left. All the other reasons that uh, comments that have been said, you know, I see the diminished uh, funding that came to Scotland. Scotland were a net beneficiary of being in Europe. And there's a whole host of things that have went on that I can fundamentally disagree with and, and uh, you know, would be in favour of being back in Europe. But, you know, you're, you're turning out a real political football and you're just trying to make it out for independence. I mean, the independence debate within your own party has been around being a competent government. And I'm sure that the, you'll perhaps bring the independence thing back again once you've settled the the uh, allegations against your party and what's went on with your financial irregularities at the moment. So, you know, that that to me would be, but if, unless you're prepared to change the wording, then I kind of bring myself to support this because I think there was a, dem a democratic decision made by the people of Scotland, and many of them looked to leave. I would still try to convince them that wasn't the case, but and, and wasn't the right decision for us. However, that's where it is. Thanks, Bailey Keenan. I'll come back to Councillor Anderson once everybody has asked um, or uh, provided their comment um, to just respond to that point. Um, I'll bring in Bailey McPherson next. Uh, thanks. Um, the uh, Council Anderson did well in, in much of her speech and then went and ruined it towards the end by lecturing the other parties, which I think we could all do well without. I don't think um, that uh, uh, the European credentials of the Liberal Democrats are in doubt. Liberals supported membership of the um, EEC as far back as the 1950s. Now, actually, just as a bit of a history lesson, the SNP uh, campaigned against continuing as members of the EEC in the 1975 referendum. And in fact, in the 2016 referendum, uh, spent less money on the campaign to remain in than it spent in its unsuccessful campaign for the Shetland by-election where it failed to unseat the Liberal Democrats. So no lectures from the SNP, thank you very much. We are in a similar position to Bailey Keenan. Um, the, the the motion is, um, uh, we share the sentiments of the motion uh, in relation to the negative effects of Brexit, um, but we object to the uh, part of the sentence about dragging out. Um, uh, um, uh, let, me, let me just find the, the exact wording. And if Councillor Anderson's prepared to remove that in the interests of um, uh, consensus, we wouldn't have any difficulty. Otherwise, we will have to uh, no vote. So um, it's the comment that says, as a result of the UK's government to, uh, the UK government's decision to drag Scotland out of the EU in 2020. The reality is this. It is perfectly true that the majority of voters in Scotland voted to stay in the European Union. But the majority of voters in Scotland, not that much earlier than that in 2014, and by a decisive margin, voted to remain members of the United Kingdom. So dragging out is the wrong terminology and the wrong language. Now, the bottom line on this is this. Either you're in the business of having a consensual approach, which the majority of that motion does, or you're not. And if you insist on keeping that part of the sentence in, we will no vote. But if you're prepared to take that part of the sentence between us and 2020 out, then we will be prepared to support the motion. Balls in your court, Councillor Anderson. Thanks very much, Bailey McPherson. I will come to Councillor Anderson in a couple of moments. I'll just bring in uh, Bailey Scott. I can see you've said not agreed. Bailey Scott, so Derek, I don't know if you just want to know your, dis well, we've not got to the formal position, so forgive me, I'll come to you. Um, well, my intention, Convener, was just to move the report as it's written without the, um, uh, I'm not supporting your uh, motion. Um, do you want the others to make comment just now, or do you want me to uh, speak to, to, to that motion. That I'm happy for you to speak to that motion. Bailey OK, Scott. well, I, I, I would move that we just accept the report as it's written. Uh, um, uh, I really think that we um, need to move on from this issue and do all we can to, to make Brexit work in the best interests of Dundee. And I totally agree with the report that it's now becoming increasingly difficult to separately identify what the Bre Brexit specific impacts are. Uh, especially with the other world events that have been such as COVID and the invasion of Ukraine. And it makes sense now to mainstream 
uh, this work into um, the, the, the council departments. Uh, it, uh, some of the comments that were made, I'd just like to reply to. Uh, the first one about Dundee and Angus, Angus College. It was interesting that the same day it was reported in the Courier about the one million pounds impact on uh, Dundee and Angus College that they were also talking about a two and a half million pound shortfall in the funding, which I think is more to do with the settlement they received from the Scottish Government rather than um, Brexit. And I would also um, uh, mention as well about it's, it's the government's uh, um, uh, plan to, um, to, to, to match domestic spending that was available through EU funding by 2024. And only last month we heard about the £40 million that we've got in UK living up cash for the Green Transport Hub. And last year we received £5 million for, from the UK Shared Prosperity Fund for, for uh, economic and development projects and part of that we heard earlier tonight is to, to go on the multiply program and um, uh, Bailey Dawson mentioned Erasmus but the, the replacement for Erasmus the, uh, the, the, the Turing fund has actually made uh, trips abroad to study and, and in other countries uh, uh, made it become more people available are able to take take part in that more than did under Erasmus and more countries are available to them now as well to visit than were available under the Erasmus scheme. Uh, the final point I would make convener is that the SNP continue to use Brexit as a lever for independence and that makes no sense to me because if Brexit has damaged the Scottish economy in the way that Councillor Anderson has said that it's done then surely it follows that if there were to uh, um, be a barrier between Scotland and the rest of the UK then that's going to have a damage to the Scottish economy uh, as well. This issue is purely a political issue for the SNP and I really think we ought to move on from it so I would just move the report as it's written. Thanks very much. Um, Bailey Scott, what I'll do is I can see there's a couple of further comments. Um, Councillor Malone, you're playing hokey cokey with your comment but I'll, I'll bring you in in just a moment um, and then I'll go back to Councillor Anderson because I presume uh, and expect that dependent upon Councillor Anderson's uh, response that might dictate whether or not you have a seconder Bailey Scott so I'm not going to ask that at this point out of fairness uh, I will come to Councillor Lynn next uh, and then uh, bring in uh, Councillor Malone. Councillor Lynn. Thank you, Ken. thank you convener. I was at the, uh, the chemist just before this meeting started to pick up a re repeat prescription and after hearing what Councillor Keenan said I'm thinking maybe I should have got something to clear out the earwax from my ears because I was completely perplexed by what he was saying about Scotland voted for Brexit. Scotland didn't vote for Brexit. Scotland hasn't voted for a Tory government for longer than I've been alive and that's quite a long period uh, of time. It's entirely appropriate that we keep pointing out that democratic deficit that we get governments we, we, we didn't vote for. And OK, perhaps we weren't dragged out of Europe by the Tory government, but we left Europe because of the votes of those south of the border. We get Tory governments because of the votes of those south of the border. And that's fair enough. That's how democracy uh, works. If people in England want conservative governments and want Brexit, that's that's fine. That's their choice, but it's not our choice, and Tory governments aren't our choice. So you know, all these the, the talk about us banging on about independence, we'll continue to bang on about independence because that's what we need to take this country forward and and, and to, to 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 stop these destructive acts taking place which damage our country. Just just one more th thing to add. We had the IJB uh, meeting last week, which I chaired. And I noted that um, a few years ago, our population was was um, predicted to increase quite significantly over the next 25 years. I notice now that in the next couple of years, we're looking at a small drop in population. Now, that comes at a time when it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to provide social care for our, our citizens because of, because of the, the, the demographic. People are, people are living longer, which is a good thing. Uh, but they're, they're needing uh, more care. So with the population dropping, our tax base decreasing, and the number of uh, you know eligible em employees decreasing, it just makes things worse. And that's why we keep banging on about independence, because so many of our country's ills come because we are tied to the union. So yeah, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Ken, I will bring in Charlie next. 
Yeah, thanks, Kavir. And I think I would say to Kenny, he really does need to get his earwax problem sorted quite urgently. And no time did Kevin Keane ever say that Scotland voted for Brexit. Um, that was not what he said. He says people in Scotland vote for breakfast and it's a Brexit and some people did. I'm actually convener a little bit concerned about how this the, the narrative of this debate has gone. What started off with, I think, something that was pretty much unanimous, uh, with the exception maybe of the Conservative. And everybody agreed with the um the expressions that were placed by Councillor Anderson earlier on about the damage that's been done by Brexit. Uh, and just to go back to, to Billy Scott, I'm in the education sector and I see the damage that's been done to both research and the opportunity for uh, students to migrate between countries and share the social experience, the social understanding of these countries. And I'll just say to Billy Scott, the, the lack of access to EU funding for research, the lack of, that then has an, a major impact in the ratings of our universities and our university standings globally. So if we are not producing world class research and that's been affected by Brexit, then ultimately it affects the sustainability of many of the organisations and universities that in the previous had previously had access to that kind of funding and have done really well. But I'm just a bit disappointed that we've went, we went, we went with something that was probably unanimous to something that's now become contentious. And I would agree with Bailey uh, Keenan and uh, Bailey Fraser that if we remove that mention, we can get back to talking about what this is really about. It's about the impact it's having on the people of Dundee. Yes, nobody was happy with, well, obviously the people who voted for Brexit in Scotland were happy with the result. But none of us in this chamber, I don't think, were happy with the result. And I think that to make some kind of party political spin on this, I think is, I, I just, I, I don't see the point. I think that what we do is concentrate on what we're all agreed on, and that is that Brexit has been a damaging uh, uh, occurrence to our economy, to our education, social politics, trade union rights, workers' rights, etc. It's been damaging. Let's focus on that. Let's focus on the message going out as being that, rather than become embroiled in what is effectively party political language. So I would urge the, 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 the reference to being dragged out. Um, I mean, I certainly never vote for Brexit, but um, at the end of the day, we've got something more important than just kind of going on about the rhetoric of being dragged out and more about how do we resolve the consequences that Brexit is having on the people of Dundee, the people of Scotland, the people of UK and beyond. Thanks very much um, for your contribution. Uh, Charlie, I think that was the last comment. If I can just maybe uh, say something very briefly before we come back. We've obviously discussed Brexit, well, literally for years now um, during the course of committee meetings and we've taken a number of motions to committee um, and there has often been division for the reasons that have already been alluded to but even going back to 2018 and I'm looking at the reports of the meeting in 2018 where we were debating uh, Brexit and again there was a division and um, it was very clear during that debate which um, a motion was moved by myself and supported by the entirety of the Labour group where we talked about very specifically in this language an attack on the democratic process of Theresa May's government at the time and silencing our parliament and that was the exact wording and for me there is a consistency in terms of the approach that's been taken in the description and some of the language used in that debate in 2018 and some of the contributions today we were talking about an attack on our parliament, attack on our democratic rights and the fact that the UK government did not respect the democratic process. Those are direct quotes from that meeting. In fact, it, um, Billy Keenan himself went on to say uh, that we need to be saying similar things to the Westminster government on how Brexit will it's, sorry, there's a start to this. It says the UK government regularly hears from lobbyists for industries like farming and fishing, how Brexit might affect them. We need to be saying similar things to the Westminster government, how Brexit will affect the city. We have to be there making Dundee's case, working with the city's two universities and getting involved. And I think that's entirely consistent with the views that have uh, been expressed today. But I'll defer to uh, Councillor Anderson. It is uh, your motion, Heather. So I'll come to you to respond to the, I suppose, uh, queries that have been uh, asked of you tonight. 
thank you, um, John. Sorry, I lost contact at the very end there. I'm, apologies for that. I got back in. Um, I have been thinking about the motion. I think the point uh, it is factually correct that 62% of people in Scotland voted to remain in the European Union. A majority of people voted to remain in the European Union in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Part of this point is that we asked for special dispensations in the Brexit withdrawal process. We got none of them. Every every opportunity that we had to try and say we need some dispensations, we were completely ignored, we weren't even invited into the meeting. So there was a democratic deficit, we were taken out of the European Union against our will and without our consent. There were Sewell, the Sewell Convention was um, used to say that we didn't consent to the Withdrawal Act. I went to the European Parliament to, with, to vote against the Withdrawal Act on Scotland's behalf. So I'm afraid I just can't change that sentence because it's factually correct. And it, it's part of the reason why we're so frustrated by the whole process, because we've had no power to influence it, despite having voted constructively against it. Um, I wasn't hectoring um, the Liberal Democrats or the Labour Party. I was trying to be encouraging um, to say that the tenor in the country has changed. We're hoping now that the rule um, bill that's currently at the House of Lords will be kicked into the long grass past the next um, general election so that we don't have a sunset clause which takes us all away from the European regulation that we depend on for protections. Um, so I was trying to be encouraging to say I hope that the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats would be more proactive um, in saying that we do have a case to rejoin the European Union instead of saying nothing. So I'm not willing to change um, the terms of the amendment. OK, thanks very much, Heather. So just to be clear, um, so we're getting the process right here. We've got a motion from Councillor Anderson uh, and uh, from Bailey Dawson um, that you have seen. We have Amendment 1, I'm going to call it at this point in time, um, from Bailey Scott, which is to retain the recommendations in the report to remove the report as is. Now, um, Fraser, Bailey McPherson, you've notified of an amendment. Um, I'm going to presume um, that this is different from what uh, Bailey um, Scott has tabled, so I'll come to you. You're correct, it is not the same as Bailey Scott's. Uh, we are prepared to accept the entirety of Councillor Anderson's uh, and, and Councillor uh, Bailey Dawson's motion with the removal of the uh, first part of the second paragraph, quote, as a result of the UK government's decision to drag Scotland out of the EU in 2020, unquote. Um, other than that, the motion is perfectly acceptable. With that in, it's perfectly unacceptable. And again, uh, I think in trying to tell us that she wasn't lecturing other parties, no. uh, Council Anderson did a little bit more of it. So I don't think um, the, the, the unfortunate thing tonight is this is something on which everyone on the council, with the exception of one member, could have united on. And thanks to the blabbing on about independence, look at the polls, guys. But thanks to the blabbing on about independence and thanks to the lack of a willingness to be compromising in order to get consensus, that's a very disappointing outcome. So the amendment is as I've explained and I think Councillor Crichton uh, intends to second me. OK, I'll come to Councillor Crichton and then I'll ask uh, for a second or for Bailey Scott. So, Michael. Thanks, Kavir. Um, I won't keep too long, but I'm more happy to second the amendment. Um, a lot of uh, colleagues, like Councillor Malone, said exactly what we're saying. We completely agree, and we're here to find solutions. And Brexit has caused havoc uh, around this country and around this city. And when Councillor Anderson started, I couldn't agree more at the start of when she said. But then the same old, I've been on this council, what, almost 12 months now? And it just deteriorates into an SNP party political broadcast. And like we all come from our different political beliefs, and that's okay. And you guys can think of independence, and you know what, we're all here for the people of Dundee, etc. But it just, I've got lines, I'm 24, I've got all these lines on my forehead. And I attribute most of them to the SNP members of this council who just go on and on. Like honestly, there's really good people around this table, well, virtual table 
looking for the people of Dundee, looking, as I say, numerous times, what we're going to do the city centre in relation to Brexit, how we're going to help our universities, how we're going to help our colleges, what are we going to do? And not just say and spout a load of absolute... I'll not use unparliamentary language. <laughs> I almost did there. But I'm more than happy to second uh, Councillor McPherson's amendment, and I hope we can find consensus and going forward throughout this term, I hope we can start to agree more cross-party um, on issues like this rather than having divisive sentences um, in motions. So I'm more happy to second Councillor McPherson's amendment. Thanks very much, Councillor Pritton. I would just reiterate the point that the motion that Councillor Anderson has set out does not contain the word independence whatsoever. So whilst the debate and the narrative can include whatever anybody wants, because as you rightly say, we all have different perspectives. We were elected on a mandate just as you were. So it's perfectly reasonable for members of my group to articulate whatever they so wish, just as it is for your members of the group. The motion and the contents of the motion does not contain the word independence. So actually, um, I think some of your contribution perhaps doesn't chime with the reality of what we're discussing tonight either. Um, now, I will come back to Bailey Scott's uh, amendment in which you moved the report as it stands. Can I check if Bailey uh, Scott has a seconder? OK, I see no one second you, Bailey Scott. Would you like your dissent noted? Yes, please, convener. Thank you very much, Derek. So we have uh, the motion by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Bailey Dawson, and the uh, amendment by Bailey McPherson, seconded by Councillor Crichton, and we will go to the vote. Willie. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. <clears throat> OK, I note the motion by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Bailey Dawson, as I circulated, and also the amendment by Bailey McPherson, as uh, seconded by Councillor Crichton, has, has been indicated with deletion of wording also as indicated. Convener. Uh, motion. Mr. Anderson. Motion. Lord Provost. Motion. Deputy Lord Provost. Motion. Billy Dawson. The motion. Councillor Nakla. Motion. Councillor Flynn. The motion. Councillor Hunter. Motion. Councillor Lynn. Motion. Billy Roberts. Bailey Roberts. We'll come back to Bailey Roberts. Councillor Rowan. The motion. Thank you. Bailey Soares. Motion. Councillor Short. Motion. Councillor Smith. Motion. Councillor Toland. Yep, definitely the motion. Thank you, Bailey Keenan. Amendment. Councillor Finnegan. Amendment. Councillor McHugh. Amendment. Councillor McCurvin. Amendment. Councillor Malone. Really disappointed to have to say I would prefer the unanimity, but I'd be supporting the amendment. Councillor Scullin. Amendment. Bailey Wright. Amendment. Bailey McPherson. The amendment. Mr. Coleman. The amendment. Mr. Creighton. The amendment. Mr. Duncan. Definitely the amendment. Bailey Scott. No vote. I'll make a further call for Bailey Roberts. Is Bailey Roberts present and wishing to make a vote? OK, I have no she reply here. Yeah. She, I don't think she can get her, her mic on, Willie. She did put uh, an A on and with her hands on a uh, motion on the screen with her hands, so she's thumbing up. I don't know if you can see it or not, or if that counts, or she needs to put it in the chat or something along those lines, Willie. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll record on that basis. That gives you 15 for the motion and 11 for the amendment. The motion is currently carried. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We will. We will move on to item seven, Willie. I think Councillor Roberts has just uh, intimated that she was supporting the amendment. I think Councillor Roberts means the motion rather than the amendment. I, 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 think, I think we should give Councillor Roberts the opportunity to clarify that in the no, chat. It does Councillor say Roberts, amendment. It does say amendment. amendment. I, I can read and that says amendment. I, 
Yes, it does. It does, and I can see Councillor Roberts gesturing, I, I think, to indicate that she's made a mistake in typing amendment rather than motion, which Ooh. she's nodding at. No, okay. If we can a little quiet, quiet I am waiting for clarification. Thank you very just much. A, just in the chat, come here. Thank you very much, Christina, for clarifying. I think that clarifies things. We will move on to the item next. Willie. Yeah, thanks very much. That concludes the item. The, the motion was carried on that basis. Item six says mainstream equalities progress report. You're asking the proposals. Um, uh, thanks again to officers for bringing forward uh, the report and this sets out how we are achieving the commitments made in the Equality Outcome Action Plan for 2021 to 2025. You'll see that there's a number of specific actions contained within that, 87 in fact, uh, whilst most are on course or have already been delivered, there are four percent of those actions that are overdue and clearly overdue actions have been reviewed and revised and there is uh, extensive work across the Council to make sure that they are delivered. Um, I will come, sorry, let me just clarify. Uh, Bailey can in first. Thanks, Convener. Convener, can I be asked, uh, given that we've an equal pay claim on the go at the moment, if officers could make comment as to how that is progressing and as to whether that will be uh, coming to any kind of conclusion soon, uh, one way or another? Thanks very much for the question. I'll bring in the Chief Executive in the first instance, uh, Kevin, just to respond to your initial query. Um, can I bring in Greg and then perhaps uh, Roger to offer some clarification on the process? Yeah, thanks, Convener, and thanks, Bailey Keenan, for the question. If I can just ask Mr Many to update members in respect to your question, Bailey Keenan, in terms of in progress with the equal pay claim. Thanks for that, Roger. Thank you, Convener. In answer to Bailey Keenan's question, he is correct. There is currently ongoing equal pay litigation in the Employment Tribunal. At this stage, I'm not in a position to give any estimate as to when that litigation might conclude. Thanks very much. Kevin, do you have a supplementary? I suppose I could be asking whether we'd be making any provision in, in the accounts for such a claim. Can I bring in perhaps Greg in the first instance, I think given Roger's answer, which is there is a process that's going through and there's no figures or specifics around that claim at this point in time, I don't know what would be set aside. I, actually, sorry, apologies. I can see Robert has taken himself off. So, uh, Mr Emmett, do you want to come in? Thank you, um, Kim, and just based on, on the advice from Roger, then at this stage, there's no um, claim that can be quantified. All there will be is reference to the fact that claims are submitted um, and are going through due process, convener. Yeah, thanks very much. And I'm sure officers will keep all elected members appraised as that process uh, continues to move through through the, the, the due process, because we're all very interested, obviously, uh, in seeing that move forward. Uh, Bailey McPherson. A question for the officers in relation to the information on page 57 of the substantive uh, page numbers. And it's really about um, the, the challenges around meeting the needs of our gypsy and travellers community. Um, I, I note uh, a little bit disappointingly that there's been um, no uh, ability to engage and consult with the travelling community uh, within the past six months. And I do understand the background to that in relation to the lack of occupancy at Balmuir Wood. Um, but um, I, I would just really like officers' assurances that there will be continued attempts to do so. And in particular, uh, I would just like to raise a question I actually raised with officers actually just immediately before the papers went out. So I'm not being critical of the fact I was given an assurance I would get a reply, but maybe tonight is an opportunity to get some further information. Um, there has been issues in the past, as we know, about, frankly, the costs of Balmuir Wood and different um, groups of uh, uh, travellers not wishing to be at Balmuir Wood at the same time. And um, members who were on the council prior, just prior to the 2017 election will recall that we had a site visit uh, in relation to a possible um, um, 
a, a stopping off facility for the travelling community, which would not incur the costs for them of the rental charges at Valmuir Wood and might uh, uh, go some way to ensure that um, roadside encampments are less likely to take place. I think everybody who attended that site visit at the time felt that was actually a very good um, um, uh, a concept. And I, I fully understand COVID got in the way, we have a, we've had a pandemic, but I would be really just grateful to learn from officers, is there any intention to take this further forward? I think we do have uh, a, a, a responsibility, as do all local authorities to our, our gypsy traveller community. And I think, uh, given the enthusiasm at the time for the idea of having a stopping off facility, I'd be grateful for officers to give some indication as to where they are with it and what con consultation they will try to engage with the travelling community on such a concept. Thanks very much for the question, Billy McPherson. And uh, I remember those conversations very well. I think it was Convener of Housing and then latterly Convener of Neighbourhood Services. And I'm sure Elaine will attest to the fact that I pushed officers very hard uh, on these issues in particular. But Elaine, I'll, I'll defer to you to come back on the substantive point Fraser makes. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And thank you, Billy McPherson, for your question. <clears throat> in relation to the wider participation, um, yes, it is quite uh, challenging due to the occupancy levels at Balmere Wood. But what I would reassure you is that we're actually reviewing our tenant participation policy and uh, you know um, that this will be front and central to that, that review, making sure that we can engage with as wide a variety of groups that, um, uh, that we represent. So um, we will certainly take the, your comments on board in relation to that review. With regard to the specific um, location and, and a stopping off area, um, we have been looking at this and I'll bring in Louise Butcher, the Head of Housing and Construction, because Louise and her team have been looking at this and um, and I think we're quite confident that we could do something to provide for um, a stopping off area in that, in that location, but I'll bring in Louise. Thanks, Elaine, and thank you for the question. Just in terms of the first point around the consultation, just an example, we undertook a good consultation with residents at the time back in 2021, which informed the improvements um, that, that were carried out at Balmure. And that not only included um, consulting with residents at the time, but also previous residents um, at that time. So just hopefully an example to reassure you that we have had positive consultations um, and we'll look to do so once we, um, it, it, with, with those who move on to the site. In terms of Camper Down and, and the site that we have, um, we did make that piece of land available during COVID um, and it was offered as an alternative um, to a roadside encampment, but it wasn't something that was taken up. And officers are currently working on just essentially making it suitable for access um, if it were to be something that, that those choose to use it when they come into the city. OK, thanks very much um, for that, uh, both Elaine and Louise. Um, I, I think just offering up the, the ground probably isn't as much as requires to be done. I think obviously there's things like toilet facilities, um, skip facilities and so on. I think I think we all recognise that. But I am re reassured and heartened by the fact that there's a real willingness to engage and obviously we'll look forward to being kept updated on the matter. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for both Elaine and Louise's responses. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for the question. Uh, Councillor McHugh next. Dorothy. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, relating to uh, working to close the gap. I think it's on page 70 of our bundle. Um, if that's OK, convener, a couple of questions. Um, the, the report says the headline pay gap for this council is very low. Um, I, and I couldn't find anywhere in the report what the headline pay gap actually is. Now, it might be there. This is a very comprehensive report. Um, so well done to whoever put it together. Um, so it may be there, but if someone could clarify what the headline pay gap um, for the council is. Um, it also says that, that, that the pay gap... Oh, Dorothy, I think you've accidentally put yourself on mute. Only sorry, just. Sorry. Um, it all, the report also says that the, the, the gap is well within acceptable levels. Um, I'm not sure what this means. You know, is there any acceptable level of inequality? 
it might be low, but if we still have inequality in pay levels, um, I, I really don't think that should be termed as acceptable. And the, the, the last thing I'd like to know is the headline pay gap, is that monitored over time? Is there a trend that we can see on the headline pay gap? Thanks very much for these uh, questions, Dorothy. And you're right, it's a really comprehensive report. And I'm sure the figure is in there because I remember looking at it, but um, I can't find it for the life of me right now. So I'll defer to Andrea to come in on those points and she may have to follow up um, or she may not. So Andrea. Yeah, so there's some detail on page 64, so the big page 64, um, but this information is put together by um, the head of people, so Francis Gregg would want to maybe respond to those questions. Okay, thanks very much, Andrea. Happy to bring in Francis at this point. We benchmark, thank you, um, Convener. We, we benchmark with other local authorities and the, the different um, pay, pay, sort of the headline pay gaps are agreed sort of across the different local authority areas and, and across Scotland. What, where we, we've made some progress um, recently in relation to the, the pay gap because of the introducing the living wage to a pay and grading system. And so the gap's lessening. We could, we could still do better, everybody could do better but it's largely um, related to some of the occupational segregation and um, which is pretty complicated and complex and um, so there's a number of reasons society wise why people are attracted into different um, job roles and things so we do try to monitor that and we do that over a period of the four years and um, but we are looking to do a bit more work on that as well so we could bring back some more information on that. Thanks. Just the other point that Dorothy raised was in terms of the use of the word acceptable. And I think I take your point on board, Dorothy. It's perhaps the terminology that's used in, in terms of, and again, I'm not even sure that it's appropriate to kind of use tolerance level, but given some of the complexities around the workforce and the gender complement within the workforce, I think that's what it's referring to. But I think you're right in saying there's probably a better form of words to reflect that. Francis, is that something we could perhaps take away and just reflect on? Yes, we will do that and give you assurance of that, uh, Councillor McHugh. Thanks Thank you much. for that. OK, thanks very much, Dorothy. And Councillor Crichton next. Michael. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I've just got a question on page 60. Um, it's in relation to the community asset transfer uh, process. Um, what's clear uh, from our engagement at uh, the Liberal Democrat group with officers in March is that Dundee's record on the number of successful uh, community asset transfers is still low. Um, I remember I had a hustings actually before the election last year uh, where Councillor Short uh, said that the um, SNP administration were really committed uh, to community asset transfers, but this number is still low. Um, can officers give assurances that the efforts will be redoubled to publicise the process and encourage community organisations uh, through the process so we can actually get more of these uh, really good things done in Dundee? Thanks very much for the question. I'll bring in officers in, in just a moment. Um, I, and just to say, I think uh, I speak probably not only for uh, Councillor Short, um, but the, all of the administration and hopefully all of the councillors when I say there is an absolute commitment to ensure that we are supporting community groups um, when they come forward and, and seek uh, that kind of support. The process obviously has a number of parts to it and I think we've had um, some examples more recently where there's been some challenges in terms of the capacity for some of those groups uh, and I think it's really important to say that even where there is an application that perhaps isn't successful. There is ongoing engagement uh, with officers and community groups to see that they are supported. So, you know, an initial, um, you know, failure perhaps for want of a better description um, might not be the end result of that process because we can then identify what the challenges are, what the additional support is, and perhaps uh, provide some advice or or some practical support in terms of them and moving forward with an application at a later date. But Robin, can I bring you in uh, just to offer some initial thoughts around that? Uh, many thanks, um, Chair. Unfortunately, my camera seems to be broken, so I can't switch on. So uh, apologies for that. Um, I think the, the, the key issue here is that community asset transfer is a formal part of the, uh, the, the relevant act, and it sets out a number of terms, and those are governed um, by communities. Um, uh, uh, 
in view of the implications for both the community organization and the council, um, the organizations typically wish to um, explore concessionary leases with the council instead. So a number of very significant examples where we have transferred assets to the community, we simply haven't used the community asset transfer mechanism. Um, so the Lynch Centre in South Road, very successful uh, long-term lease on a concessionary uh, rental, um, Two Street Soccer, uh, the Duddock Castle, which obviously has been taken over by the, 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 the Circle, um, very successfully, and we are marketing Mitchell Street, for example, to try and secure a long-term third sector tenant. So there really is um, a significant appetite amongst officers to um, provide surplus accommodation for the third sector and charities. Um, but I think uh, from memory, there hasn't been any, um, in fact, only one community asset transfer, I think, over the past few years. I'm not sure whether Marie's on the call and she wants to come in or Elaine. Thanks uh, very much, Robin. I'm not sure if there's too much to add, but Elaine, I'll let you come in. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, absolutely committed to supporting community groups who who want to embark on community asset transfers. But as as has been alluded to, you know, it, it needs groups to be able to have the capacity to do that. So we do work with groups, and 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 if groups have the capacity and, and are willing to take that forward, we will certainly support them. What I can offer is that we could do a short briefing note for elected members um, on the whole aspect of community asset transfer because um, it has been a while since we've updated elected members, so I'm happy to uh, organise that briefing note. Thanks very much, Elaine. I'm sure that would be well received. Michael, that answer your question? Yeah, no, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Elaine. And yeah, no, just I'll, I and I hope I'm speaking from my group that we will support any efforts to help community asset transfer and we acknowledge the issues um, in relation to that, but obviously we want to see these numbers increasing. Um, so yeah, briefing would be great and um, most appreciated, Elaine. So thank you. Thanks very much. And I think that's the last question on this item. So can I take this as agreed? Thank you very much. Move on to the next one, Willie. Petition item seven, modernising the workforce. You're asking the recommendations. Again, members will remember that we've previously taken reports of a similar nature um, in relation to looking at the potential for voluntary early retirement and flexible retirement. Really important to say that obviously um, where there is any kind of service redesign or suggestions around that, then there is a due process to go through. And I think I really want to reiterate the point that this has been brought forward after consultation and contribution from trade unions themselves. And I think it talks to the, the engagement that's happened that there isn't a trade union deputation tonight, because certainly from my understanding, they are content with the contents of the report on the basis that it is about uh, supporting the wider uh, council efforts to um, maintain and to deliver the services across the board. But I can see there's a number of questions, so I'll come to those. Uh, Councillor Coleman. Oh, sorry, Councillor Coleman, your question was on item seven, which we've dealt with um, and I've moved on. Do you mean Sorry, if I have I given the wrong number, I meant to be this one, yes. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. You made me panic there the thinking I missed you, so that's this, fine. This, please, this please is item continue. seven, convener. This is item seven. Oh, so, I'm sorry. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Thank you for keeping me right. Daniel, Thank you please continue. Given the extent of retirements and voluntary early retirements across the council, um, there is an obvious potential loss of huge areas of knowledge um, as long experienced managers leave the service and leave the council. Can I ask for assurances that in the lead up to staff retirement, and particularly during flexible retirement periods, departments ensure that every effort has been made to impart knowledge from these experienced uh, staff to the, the remaining staff that will continue providing the service? I happen to, yeah, I work for a local authority myself elsewhere. I know this can be a bit of an issue when a long member, long stand member staff um, uh, has their retirement. And thinking of perhaps shadowing rules and succession planning, for example, would be, um, it, 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 we provide public services. We don't want our services to suffer because um, a lot of knowledge has walked out the door when someone has, uh, has retired. Thanks very much for the question, Councillor Coleman. You're absolutely right. And again, I think that's why it's so important and imperative during this process uh, that senior members of staff are assessing all of that impact to make sure that we've got the service and the delivery of that service in mind when they're considering whether or not to accept an application. And this is really, this report obviously is not given a blank check um, to officers to go away and allow lots of people to leave the organisation, but really just reinforcing that point that we have an ability to look at that 
and to use that flexibility to identify key areas of service where it might lend itself uh, to allow people to retire early or flexible retirement. And your point's uh, very well made and one that has been a topic of conversation for a period of time. And I think just reflecting on um, the kind of COVID pandemic in particular, I think we've all probably got both direct and indirect experience of people who have reevaluated their life, if that's not too big a claim, uh, in the aftermath of COVID and have taken decisions to perhaps reduce their working hours or to uh, look for flexible retirement. And being flexible with, with the workforce, I think, is really important for two reasons. One, um, to give them the certainty that if they want to reduce their hours or retire early, then they have the ability to do so through a scheme like this. Uh, and secondly, to ensure that we can start to build and ensure that we've got that succession planning in place. And there is a balance in that to be struck there in terms of losing experience and giving new opportunities to perhaps younger member, uh, younger members of the works course and new people coming into the council as well. But with all that said, I will actually let an officer answer the question. So uh, Robert Emmett, can I bring you in at this point, please? Thank you, convener. Um, the the um, all services have been working on developing workforce plans and, and at the heart of that is thinking about succession planning and training and skills that are needed for the future delivery of um, services. Um, so the um, the points that um, Councillor Coleman raised are at the front of our minds in terms of looking ahead. Obviously, it's difficult. People's circumstances can change um, unexpectedly and quickly, but retirement is generally something that people plan towards. And the other plank in our um, workforce planning that supports that is our quality conversations with staff and making sure we are engaging with staff and talking about to them about their futures. And this report sets out a range of measures which will help us in that planning. Um, critical in that is that we're not inviting open applications, but we're looking at things based on service need and areas where we need to um, make changes in the workforce. So I hope that helps, Convener. Thanks very much. I can see Daniel Norden, so thanks for that response. I will come to Bailey Scott next. Derek. No, thanks, Convener. Um, I, th I think you answered my, my question when you talked about um, consultation with trade unions, because I, uh, I was going to ask, what consultation and what the results of the consultation were in respect of the flexible um, retirement scheme, because partial retirement is offered by a lot of organisations as a flexible working pattern option. And it now is, it seems that we're going to be um, telling folk who go for that option that it needs to be a, um, uh, 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 you need to give a, a date of when they're actually going to, to leave the service. So that's going to make it very um, much less attractive to a lot of people. So it was really to ask what the views were that you'd had back from the staff uh, about that option because um, and, and also whether because there will be lots of people who are currently on um, flexible partial retirement and have not given a, a date for when they're likely to leave um, service. So I'd like to know how those two things match up. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I'll bring in the Chief Executive in just a moment and again to offer some initial thoughts. I think going back to Councillor Coleman's uh, point around succession planning, one of the challenges and anecdotally speaking to other members of staff as well uh, that we've had, uh, particularly around flexible retirement where it's open ended is an inability to actually look at the progression of the staff and to identify how we might backfill those roles because we don't know when that member of staff may uh, look to retire. So this is actually about making sure the process is very clear and giving both clarity to council services as well as to the individual uh, involved. But Greg, do you want to come in on the substantive point, please? Yeah, thanks, convener, and thanks, Bailey Scott. So just following on from the convener, part of this around flexible retirement is around succession planning and workforce planning, where we're looking to give people the option of flexible retirement subject to the constraints of the policy, but also then plan for that knowledge sharing and that handover. Um, within the policy, it is very clear that individuals who currently have a flexible retirement quest, this is not going to be retrospectively applied. And for those that do specify an end date, there is the option to have further discussions with their line manager about that being extended. In addition to that convener, we also offer flexible working, 
which would be people who aren't at retirement age who can opt to uh, reduce their hours. And we've seen certainly more of that, particularly around child care or for people that have other responsibilities, such as caring responsibilities. We aim to be a good employer. So part of this is getting a balance between allowing the staff to flexibly retire, but also ensuring we've got the necessary skills to allow that transition when someone moves into retirement. I'm happy to um, convener to pass over to Robert Emmett just to give Bailey Scott the assurance about the discussion with the trade unions. Yeah. Robert. Thank you, convener, and thank you, Bailey Scott. So we, this this was a point that we discussed with the unions and, and we talked about whether or not we should have a fixed period of time um, for example, two years as 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 a standard for um, flexible retirement, we agreed it was better if parties agreed at the outset what was appropriate. And for some of the reasons the chief executives just outlined, um, it was agreed that it would be best to have a have a fixed period that was agreed at the outset, which should, could meet the needs of the individual and of the service. Thanks, Derek. You happy with that? Yeah, no follow up, convener. Thanks very much, uh, Bailey Kinnan, Kevin. Thanks, convener. I was uh, considering uh, moving a deferral on this particular report um, for a few reasons. Um, but I've, I obviously decided that I would ask the question of officers, and there was three questions that I asked of them. And I'll give you the reasons why I was thinking of moving deferral anyway. Uh, the, the amount I would like to know the amount of staff in cash and uh, in full time equivalent terms that there's been. Uh, save uh, that there's been savings over the last uh, from each department uh, over the last 10 years. And I would like to know the amount of savings in cash and full time equivalents this proposal would deliver by each department over the time scale of, of this particular uh, program of, of redundancy, stroke, early retirement, uh, flexible retirement, and the like. And, and you know. I would like to know how these savings will be achieved with, but without there being any further detriment to the service that we're receiving. And that's the bit that gets us most, because I was always under the understanding that when we fire a, a question to officers, that we can expect a response within a week. And when constituents come to myself, they're probably coming to me having tried themselves to resolve a problem. And, I have, and I'm three weeks down the line for some people and don't have an answer for officers to give them. So it looks to me very much like a, a, a quite a range of services across council are broken at the moment without any mere staff getting to go out the door. So I've, I've got real concerns about that. Uh, the other reason that I asked is I always say thought, having listened to Scottish government ministers, when they say things like, we're paying better wages here than, we're, than elsewhere within the UK, that they've changed their policy on delivering the Tories' agenda of austerity to the workforce, and, and that there's a, the, you know, that would be open for jobs being created within local government as opposed to jobs going out the door on a regular basis. So I've got real concerns of that, but perhaps officers can either make an attempt at giving me some response to that and indeed tell me how they're going to resolve the problem of me in particular and no doubt others. Because if I'm, if I'm being singled out for not receiving a, a response from the officer, that's frankly no good enough. But I think that others will be uh, uh, going through the same as I'm getting, no getting answers, no being able to get back to con constituents and continually chasing responses. Thanks for the question. I'm bringing the Chief Executive. I think um, I'm sure I speak for officers when I say if there's particular issues, then Chief Executive and others would be more than happy, particularly Executive Directors, to hear about them. And I know, you know, from uh, again, everybody will have uh, different experiences. Um, some responses come very quickly, some take slightly longer, and there's always a myriad of issues. There's holidays, there's sickness, there's um, capacity issues. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would caution um, conjecture about inflating or conflating this particular report with a delay in a response, but I'll, I'll let Greg come in and respond directly to the points that you've raised and hopefully give you the reassurance that you're looking for, Kevin. Greg? 
Yeah, thanks, convener. And thanks, Bailey um, Keenan. So in response to your first question, unfortunately, given the, the number of records that the finance team would need to go through to go back 10 years to look at the number of FTEs that have been granted early retirement and also the cash saving, I'm not able to provide that tonight, but I can ask officers to provide that information to committee. It will require us to go back and look at 10 sets of annual accounts and working papers with that so that information can follow. In terms of the cash proposal that's being proposed within this paper, there's no cash proposal being proposed within this paper. What officers are seeking to do is have a scheme that is available that we can be open with trade unions and staff about when we're looking at service redesigns, which as the convener said at the start of the discussion of this item, if there is any significant redesign, they come back to committee. Examples of the ones that I've been involved with in previous roles were around the establishment of a corporate debt function. So the scheme is not intended to give you financial savings at the moment. It's a tool, and if there's significant redesign, then that would be a committee decision. In terms of looking at the um, third part of your question, which was around um, understanding where there could be detriment and how that would be avoided, then that again, Bailey Keenan, would be dependent on where that redesign was and would feature um, in this part of that report. Um, and that's not something that I can comment on, given the level and the diversity of services that the Council provides at this point. <clears throat> Your final question as well, or comment, if I can address it, that if any elected members do have concerns regarding responses from officers, then my door is always open. Please do contact me and I will speak to the relevant service and executive director to ensure that responses are provided in a timely manner to all elected members. And indeed, if there are areas that are stopping us doing that, for example, annual leave or sickness, that elected members are kept fully up to date as to when they can expect a response. Thanks, convener. Thanks very much, Greg, and thanks for committing to, to follow up with that information. I think it is important to reiterate that point that you've just made again and what I made in the outline comments at the introduction uh, about this being an opportunity, I suppose, and again reflecting on the conversations that have taken place with trade unions directly and, and this being a position that they have um, supported. I'm reassured by the fact that we're, this isn't a, an attempt or an opportunity to give officers, a, a, as I say, a kind of blank check to go out and start uh, hacking away at uh, staff in any way, shape or form, because there's due process and that would mean uh, there would be committee reports that came back with any significant changes. And again, we would have to be fully appraised of the detail that sat behind that, including the financial figures that you, you referenced, Bailey Keenan. But I'll come back to you uh, in case you've got a supplementary. I'm I'm happy enough to to wait on the information that the chief execs agreed to, uh, and and certainly I'll keep them well informed about the the issues that I wait response on. Thanks very much, uh, Kevin. That's appreciated. Um, I see no further questions at this point, so can I take this report as agreed, please? Thank you, Willie. We'll move on. Thank you. Item eight then is the annual procurement report. You asked to give the recommendations. Uh, yeah, hopefully this uh, report is self-explanatory, clearly provides uh, a great bit of detail and Appendix 1 sets out the range of activities and organisations that uh, we uh, procure uh, and work with. And I think we're all absolutely clear uh, that we want to maximise the benefits for uh, the broader community. Um, I'm also really interested in the deployment of, as you'll see referenced in the report, the community wish lists, uh, which are really spearheading efforts within communities to identify what their needs are, what their asks are, and to work with uh, corporate partners and entities through the procurement process to try and deliver them. Uh, and one of the things I was reflecting on with officers um, in terms of this report was also the things that we don't always capture. So I was reminded of uh, Dalfield Multies uh, when we created the community space during the uh, eco work, uh, the external wall insulation programme and the, the build for the, the gas units outside. And there was materials that were donated and there was uh, contributions in terms of free labour uh, that was contributed, which wasn't captured during this process. So I think there's also a job to do to make sure that we're trying to capture everything. And I know the procurement team uh, are working incredibly hard to make sure that that reflects uh, both the ambition of the community, the City Council, and again, is captured within reports like this. So are there any questions, comments on this report before us? Nope. Can I take that as... Oh, sorry, Councillor Flynn, you were just quick enough. Oh, type in, convener. Sorry about that. 
Can we I just like there's been much said about the normal tendering process we've been putting out over uh, recent years and the, the amount of uh, community payback there is. And I think the community benefits and what is a very good report, I have to say, very detailed report is quite clear, especially on the, the local labour and the local construction spend within the report and the job opportunities that come from that. In addition to that, I think the community and inter interaction with the developers, for example, and the builders we and the construction side of things which we bring in is actually excellent. I was, in, I, I was involved with some down at the Broughty Ferry, for example, the flood protections and the work at Metal Tech did with the schools in conjunction with McLaughlin Harvey. And bringing the schools into the mix and understand what we're actually doing is fantastic. And you see the encouragement of the community within all this. And I think uh, Clearly, the community well building approach is the right way to go. It's a, the only way to go in the future, and I'm sure we'll continue to do that going forward. And if we meet these targets, it's 74 percent average local labour. Absolutely fantastic to see that seven million pounds spent or over seven and a half million pounds spent locally, I should say, is absolutely excellent again because it benefits the local communities and local businesses. So I'm delighted to see the report, welcome the report, and I'm sure it will continue going forward. Thank you, convener. Thanks very much uh, for those comments, which I wholeheartedly endorse. Uh, any other comments? No. Can I take this as agreed? Thank you very much. We'll move on. Willie. OK, item nine then, so corporate procurement strategy, you're asking the proposals. Again, this is obviously directly related to the item that we've just discussed, and this report presents the corporate procurement strategy for review and approval. The strategy is for one year only, and hopefully that's self-explanatory because we are delivering on the ambition in the Emerging Community Wealth Building Strategy, which uh, Councillor Flynn has just alluded to. And because delivering on that ambition in that document uh, will mean further changes, it makes sense not to get ahead of ourselves too much. So the strategy is for one year, uh, but there is uh, further reports that will come uh, forward to committee on the back of the community wealth building uh, strategy and will adapt the approach to encompass and include any adaptions that are required going forward. So I can see a couple of questions. So uh, Fraser, I'll come to you first. Um, I have a question for the chief executive really, and it's really about the information about the key objectives on page 161. Um, and there are a number, there are five key objectives um, um, indicated there. The first one is to obtain value for money from every purchase, and I don't doubt for one moment the officers do indeed try to do so. Now, as I've raised, and I raised it at the last Special Policy and Resources Committee back on uh, something like the 27th of March, um, uh, for not for the first time, I'm beginning to sound like a broken record on this, um, about the need to present clearly and publicly how that best value has been achieved when we are signing off tenders, where we are agreeing to procurement. And um, the, I, I was just reflecting in, in reading this report on the chief executives, to be fair, positive response. But if I'm being honest, not the first time I've had that positive response. And I'm, I'm just reflecting on it and thinking, I've had a positive response on more than one occasion that the way we present these, particularly where procurement hubs are being used, will be reviewed. What I think was missing from the last response was the sort of commitment as to the time frame in which this will be done. And I was just really wondering if the chief executive can confirm to committee the sort of time scale in which this is going to be reviewed so that we can have confidence, not that we are obtaining value for money for every purchase, because I don't doubt, as I say, uh, the good efforts of officers in that respect, but we are presenting this clearly and publicly when we are agreeing to tenders and signing off um, what can be often very large amounts of public money. Thanks for the question, Fraser. Greg? Thanks, convener, and thanks, Bailey McPherson. So you're right, I did give a response to you, and since then I have had discussions with Neil Martin and Paul Thompson, and not only are we looking at the information that will be contained in the reports that come to committee, particularly around why frameworks have been selected and how we publicly show why they've been selected and how they demonstrate best value, but also to have an elected member briefing about the use of frameworks, the benefit of those, and the works that have been done prior to the framework 
what's coming to the council. So if I can convene it, if I can pass to Paul Thompson to give an outline of timescales um, of the work that Paul and Neil have been doing. And again, as I did at the last meeting, apologies, this has taken slightly longer than anticipated, but that's just been due to competing priorities. But Paul and Neil have been discussing this with me since the last committee meeting. So convener, if it's okay with you, if I can ask Paul to come in. Absolutely, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Convener, and thank you, Bailey McPherson, for the question. So I can confirm that Neil and I actually have a meeting in the diary tomorrow scheduled to discuss the very matter, Bailey McPherson. So following that, I think we'd be in a position by the end of the week, hopefully, to get to give an indication in terms of when that briefing would be. Um, if I could further add to that, though, in terms of the report that you see before you tonight, and in particular um, recommendation 2.1b, and uh, moving forward, it's precisely um, the the reason we're suggesting to bring forward procurement strategies for any regulated procurement so we could evidence quite clearly within that strategy how we intend uh, to meet these priorities that are set out within the council plan in terms of securing um, the, the objectives that you note. OK, thanks, thanks very much. That, that, that was uh, a very helpful um, uh, response from both Mr. Colgan and, uh, and Mr. Thompson. Uh, the briefing's welcome and the time frame for the briefing's welcome, but for me, the bottom line on this now, I am a broken record on it and my group will not let go on it. We want to see the amendments to the way we present them in committee reports. So the briefing's welcome, but that's not the public. I think the issue for us, and as I say, we've never doubted the good intention to achieve value for money, but it's in particular, and you touched on it, uh, uh, Paul, it's how we demonstrate best value where we're using procurement hubs. And I think they should, that should be crystal clear in the committee reports presented. So in uh, uh, moving forward to the briefing, I'd be grateful to be kept updated on the time frame in which the presentation of committee reports is reviewed. But I'm, I'm genuinely grateful to both Greg and Paul for their helpful responses. Thanks very much, um, Fraser, for that question. And I'll come to Bailey Scott next. Derek. Thanks, Kavina. I think the question I had might come out in the briefing that we're going to be getting from Paul, but it was really in, in respect of negotiated tenders uh, insofar as it relates to capital projects. I'm thinking of the big projects that are taken on by construction services, and uh, I wonder what process is followed to ensure that the, these contracts meet the procurement strategy objective of the, the value for money for every purchase. I mean, uh, are, are benchmarking benchmarkings done against what would be open contracts? To ensure that we're still getting value for money, sorry. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Derek. Um, I'll bring in Neil Martin in the first instance. Neil? Thanks, convener. Thanks, Bailey Scott. So in, ter in terms of every tender that's looked at, whether it's construction services or not, there's obviously an audit and a check put in place. There's a sense check in terms of how that is evaluated in terms of market levels and such like. And then obviously closer to home in terms of construction services, uh, as you're aware, Bailey Scott, we'll have done benchmarking exercises at appropriate times in the past. And uh, in terms of that, uh, the uh, results have shown that construction services have uh, reflected favourably in terms of reducing that best value. Um, in terms of the current market position, we're probably in a favourable our construction services are in a favourable position in terms of having a stable workforce compared to some of the uh, private sector uh, organisations. And similarly, uh, I'm sure Paul will be able to uh, explain in more detail in terms of how we we'll go about procuring the materials and such like through some of the national frameworks where they've got a a uh, set period of time for purchasing maybe gives a bit more protection again in terms of the volatility of the marketplace that the the private sector's got so so there's there's these checks and balances in place and uh, um at, at the appropriate times in the future i'm sure we'll be looking at further benchmarking uh, to ensure that we're continuing to get that best value from construction services thanks Neil. you happy with that response Deli? I think you said yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, and, and again, we'll make sure that point is picked up and, and elaborated on or expanded uh, in, during the briefing as well. So thanks for the question. Uh, see no further questions on this report. So can I take this as agreed? Thank you. Move on. Deputation on item 10, procurement of mobile devices and software licensing. You're asking the recommendations. 
fully self-explanatory. Any questions? Can I take this as agreed? Thank you very much. Willie? Right, to 11's software solutions report. Uh, you're asking you the proposal. Again, any questions on this? I realise I'm rattling through this quickly, so I'll just hold off for a moment in case. Nope. OK, can we take this as agreed? Thank you very much. And final item. The mini item item 12 is contract for internal audit services support. You ask you the recommendation. And hopefully self-explanatory. Any questions? None. Can I take this as agreed? Thank you very much. That concludes the business. Thank you very much for your participation and I shall see you all soon. Have a good week. Take care.